Chapter 8 To Make a Garden Grow Now we knew the full truth. We would be in this room until the day our grandfather died. And it came to me in the night when I was low and dreary that perhaps she had known from the very beginning that her father was not the kind to forgive anyone anything. But, said my cheerful, optimistic Christopher, any day could see him gone. That is the way of heart disease. A clot could break free and find its way to his heart or lung and snuff him out like a candle. Chris and I said cruel and irreverent things between ourselves, but in our hearts we ached, knowing it was wrong, and we were disrespectful as a way to salve the pain of our bleeding self-esteem. Now look, he said, since we are going to be up here a while longer, we should set about with more determination to placate the twins and ourselves with more entertaining things to do. And when we really apply ourselves, gosh knows we might just dream up some pretty wild and fantastic things. When you have an attic full of junk and great armoires full of rotting, stinking, but nevertheless very fancy costumes, you are inspired to put on plays, naturally. And since one day I was going to be on stage, I would be the producer, the director, the choreographer, as well as the female star. Chris, of course, would have to play all the male lead roles, and the twins could participate and play minor parts. But they didn't want to participate. They wanted to be the audience and sit and watch and applaud. It wasn't such a bad idea for what was a play without an audience. It was a great pity they didn't have any money to buy tickets. We'll call this dress rehearsal, said Chris. And since you seem to be everything else and know everything about theatrical productions, you write the script. Ha! As if I needed to write the script, this was my chance to play Scarlet O'Hara. We had the hoops to wear under the flouncy ruffled skirts and the stays to squeeze you tight and just the clothes for Chris to wear and fancy parasols with a few holes. The trunks and the armoires offered a great deal to select from and I had to have the best costume hauled from one of the armoires, and the underwear and petticoats came from one of the trunks. I'd curled my hair in rags so it hung in long, spiraling curls, and on my head I wore a floppy old leghorn hat of straw bedecked with faded silk flowers and banded by green satin ribbon that was browning about the edges. My ruffled gown, worn over wire hoops, was of some flimsy stuff that felt like voile. Once, I think it might have been pink. Now it was hard to say just what color it was. Rhett Butler wore the fancy costume of cream-colored trousers and a brown velvet jacket with pearl buttons and a satin vest underneath with faint red roses scattered on it. Come, Scarlet, he said to me. We've got to escape Atlanta before Sherman reaches here and sets the town on fire. Chris had strung ropes on which we draped blankets to act as stage curtains, and our audience of two were stomping their feet impatiently, eager to see Atlanta burn. I followed Rhett onto the stage and was ready to taunt and tease, flirt and bewitch and put him on fire before I rushed off to some pale-haired Ashley Wilkes, when one of my bedraggled ruffles caught beneath my too large, funny-looking old shoe and down I sprawled in an undignified heap that showed my dirty pantaloons with lace hanging in ragged strings. The audience gave me a standing ovation, thinking this was a pratfall and part of the act. Play's over, I announced, and began to rip off the smelly old clothes. Let's eat, cried Carrie, who'd say anything to take us down from this despised attic. Corey pouted his lower lip and looked around. I wish we had the garden again, he said so wistfully it hurt. I don't like to swing when the flowers don't sway in the wind. His flaxen hair had grown long enough to touch his shirt collar, and it curled in ringlets, while Carrie's hair hung halfway down her back and rippled like cascading waves. They were wearing blue today for Monday. We had colors for each day. Yellow was our Sunday color, red was for Saturday. The wish spoken by Corey put thoughts into Chris's head, for he turned in a slow circle, giving the huge attic an appraising survey. Admittedly, this attic is a grim and dreary place, he mused, but why can't we, as a constructive way to use our creative talents, 
bring about a metamorphosis and turn this ugly caterpillar into a brilliant, soaring butterfly. He smiled at me, at the twins, in such a charming, convincing way that I was immediately won over. It would be fun to attempt to pretty up this dismal place and give the twins a colourful, fake garden where they could swing and enjoy looking at beauty. Of course, we'd never finished decorating all of the attic. It was so tremendous. And any day the grandfather could die, and then we'd leave, never to return again. We couldn't wait for Mama to come that evening, and when she did, Chris and I enthusiastically told her our plans of decorating the attic and turning it into a cheerful garden the twins wouldn't be afraid of. The strangest expression flickered momentarily in her eyes. Well, now, she said brightly, if you're going to make the attic pretty, first you must make it clean, and I'll do what I can to help. Mama sneaked up mops, pails, brooms, scrub brushes, and boxes of soap powder. She went down on her knees beside us to scrub in the attic corners and around the edges and under the large pieces of furniture. I marveled that our mother knew how to scrub and clean. When we lived in Gladstone, we had a twice-weekly maid who came in to do all the hard, dreary things that would redden Mama's hands and break her fingernails. And here she was, on her hands and knees, wearing faded old blue jeans and old shirt, her hair pinned up in a bun. I really admired her. It was hard, hot, demeaning work, and she never once complained, only laughed and chatted and acted as if this was great fun. In a week of hard work, we had most of the attic as clean as possible. Then she brought us insect repellent to kill what bugs had hidden from us while we cleaned, we swept up dead spiders and other crawlers by the bucketfuls. We threw them out of a back window where they rolled to a lower section of the roof. Later the rain came to wash them down into the gutters. Then the birds found them and had a grisly feast, while we four sat on a window ledge and watched. We never saw a rat or a mouse, but we saw droppings. We presumed they were waiting for all the hustle and bustle to calm down before they ventured out of their dark and secret places. Now that the attic was clean, Mama brought us green plants, plus a spiky amaryllis that was supposed to bloom at Christmas time. I frowned when she said this, for we wouldn't be here then. We'll take it with us, said Mama, reaching out to stroke my cheek. We'll take all of our plants when we go, so don't frown and look unhappy. We wouldn't want to leave anything living and loving of sunshine in this attic. We put our plants in the attic schoolroom, for that room had windows facing east. Happy and gay, we all tripped down the narrow stairs, and Mama washed up in our bathroom, then fell exhausted into her special chair. The twins climbed up on her lap as I set the table for lunch. That was a good day, for she stayed until dinner time, then sighed and said she'd have to go. Her father made such demands on her, wanting to know where she went every Saturday and why she stayed so long. Can you sneak back to see us before bedtime? Chris asked. I'm going to the movies tonight, she said evenly. But before I leave, I'll slip in to see you again. I've got some of those little boxes of raisins that you can snack on between meals. I forgot to bring them with me. The twins were crazy about raisins, and I was happy for them. Are you going to the movies alone? I asked. No, there's a girl I grew up with. She used to be my best friend, and she's married now. I'm going to the movies with them. She lives only a few houses from here. She got up and went to the windows, and when Chris had the lights turned out, she parted the draperies and pointed in the direction of the house where her best friend lived. Elena has two unmarried brothers. One is studying to be a lawyer. He goes to Harvard Law School, and the other is a tennis pro. Mama, I cried. Are you dating one of those brothers? She laughed and let the draperies fall. Turn on the lights, Chris. No, Kathy, I am not dating anyone. To tell you the truth, I'd rather go right to bed. I'm that tired. I really don't care for musicals anyway. I'd rather stay with my children. But Elena keeps insisting I get out, and when I keep refusing, she keeps asking why. I don't want people to wonder why I stay home every weekend. That's why, occasionally, I do have to go sailing or to the movies. To make the attic even pretty seemed highly improbable. To make it a beautiful garden soared over the rainbow, 
it was going to take an enormous amount of hard work and creative ability, but that darn brother of mine was convinced we could do it in no time at all. He soon had our mother so sold on the idea that every day she went to secretarial school, she came back to us bearing colouring books from which we could cut out pre-drawn flowers. She brought us watercolour sets, many brushes, boxes of crayons, huge amounts of coloured craft paper, fat pots of white paste and four pairs of blunt-nosed scissors. Teach the twins to colour and cut out flowers, she instructed, and let them participate in all you undertake. I nominate you their kindergarten teachers. She came from that city an hour's train ride away, glowing with radiant good health, her skin fresh and rosy from outside air, her clothes so beautiful they took my breath away. She had shoes of every color, and bit by bit she was accumulating new pieces of jewelry, which she called junk jewelry. But somehow those rhinestones looked more like diamonds to me from the way they sparkled. She fell into her chair, exhausted but happy, and told us of her day. Oh, how I wish those typewriters had letters on the keys. I can't seem to remember but one row. I have to look up at the wall chart every time, and that slows me down. And I'm not very good at remembering the bottom row, either. But I do know where all the vowels are. You use those keys more than any others, you know. So far, my typing speed is twenty words per minute, and that's not too good. Plus, I make about four mistakes in those twenty words. And those shorthand squiggles... She sighed as if they, too, had her baffled. Well, I guess I'll learn eventually. After all, other women do, and if they can, then I can. Do you like your teachers, Mama? asked Chris. She giggled girlishly before she answered. First, let me tell you about my typing teacher. Her name is Mrs. Helena Brady. She's shaped very much like your grandmother, huge, only her bosom is much larger. Really, hers is the most remarkable bosom I've ever seen. And her bra straps keep slipping off her shoulders. And if it isn't her bra straps, then it's her slip straps. And she's always reaching into the neckline of her dress to haul them back into place. And the men in the class always snicker. Do men take typing classes? asked I, very surprised. Yes, there are a few young men there. Some are journalists, writers, or have some good reason for wanting to know how to type. And Mrs. Brady is divorced and has a keen eye for one of those young men. She flirts with him while he tries to ignore her. She's about ten years older than he is at least, and he keeps looking at me. Now, don't get any ideas, Kathy. He's much too short for me. I couldn't marry a man who couldn't pick me up and carry me over the threshold. I could pick him up. He's only five feet two. We all had a good laugh, for Daddy had been a full foot taller, and he had easily picked our mother up. We'd seen him do that many times, especially on those Friday nights when he came home and they'd look at each other so funny. Mama, you're not thinking of getting married again, are you? Chris asked in the tightest of voices. Swiftly her arms went around him. No, darling, of course not. I loved your father dearly. It would take a very special man to fill his shoes... And so far, I haven't met one who measures up to even his outgrown socks. To play kindergarten teachers was great fun, or could have been if our student body had been the least bit willing. But as soon as we had breakfast finished, our dishes washed and put away, our food stashed in the coldest place, and the hour of ten had come and gone with servants from the second floor, Chris and I each dragged a wailing twin up into the attic schoolroom. There we could sit at the student desks and make a grand mess, cutting flower forms from the coloured craft paper, using the crayons to glorify the colours with stripes and polka dots. Chris and I made the best flowers. What the twins made looked like coloured blobs. Modern art, Chris named the flowers they made. On the dull and grey slat walls we pasted up our Goliath flowers. Chris ascended the old ladder with the missing rungs again, so he could dangle down long strings tied to the attic rafters, and to these strings we fastened colourful blossoms that constantly moved in the attic drafts. Our mother came up to view our efforts, and she gave us all a pleased smile. Yes, you're doing marvellously well. You are making it pretty up here. 
and thoughtfully she moved closer to the daisies, as if considering something else she could bring us. The next day she came with a huge flat box containing coloured glass beads and sequins, so we could add sparkle and glamour to our garden. Oh, we did slave over making those flowers, for whatever occupation we pursued, we pursued it with diligent, fervid zeal. The twins caught some of our enthusiasm, and they stopped howling and fighting and biting when we mentioned the word attic, for after all the attic was slowly but surely turning into a cheerful garden, and the more it changed, the more determined we became to cover every last wall in that endless attic. Each day, of course, when Mama was home from that secretarial school, she had to view the day's accomplishments. Mama gushed Carrie in her breathless bird twitter. That's all we do all day, make flowers, and sometimes Kathy, she don't want us to go downstairs and eat lunch. Kathy, you mustn't become so preoccupied with decorating the attic that you forget to eat your meals. But Mama, we're doing it for them, so they won't be so scared up there. She laughed and hugged me. My, you are the persistent one, you and your older brother both. You must have inherited that from your father. Certainly not from me. I give up so easily. Mama, I cried, made uneasy. Are you still going to school? You are getting better at typing, aren't you? Yes, of course I am. She smiled again and then settled back in her chair, holding up her hand and seeming to admire the bracelet she wore. I started to ask why she needed so much jewellery to attend secretarial school, but she spoke instead. What you need to make now is animals for your garden. But, Mama, if roses are impossible to make, how can we even draw animals? She gave me a wry little smile as she traced a cool finger over my nose. Oh, Kathy, what a doubting Thomas you are. You question everything, doubt everything. When you should know by now, you can do anything you want to if you want to badly enough. And I'm going to tell you a secret I've known about for some time. In this world where everything is complicated, there is also a book to teach you how simple everything can be. That I was to find out. Mama brought us art instruction books by the dozens. The first of these books taught us to reduce all complicated designs into basic spheres, cylinders, cones, rectangles, and cubes. A chair was just a cube. I hadn't known that before. A Christmas tree was just an inverted ice cream cone. I hadn't known that before either. People were just combinations of all those basic forms. Spheres for heads. Arms, necks, legs, torso, upper and lower were only rectangular cubes or cylinders, and triangles made for feet. And believe it or not, using this basic method with just a few simple additions, we soon had rabbits, squirrels, birds, and other small, friendly creatures, all made by our very own hands. True, they were peculiar-looking. I thought their oddities made them all the sweeter. Chris coloured all his animals realistically, I decorated mine with polka dots, gingham checks, plaids, and put lace-edged pockets on the laying hens. Because our mother had shopped in a sewing notion store, we had lace, cords of all colours, buttons, sequins, felt, pebbles, and other decorative materials. The possibilities were endless. When she put that box into my hands, I know my eyes must have shown all the love I felt for her then. For this did prove she thought of us when she was out in the world. She wasn't just thinking of new clothes for herself and new jewellery and cosmetics. She was trying to make our confined lives as pleasant as possible. One rainy afternoon, Corey came running to me with an orange paper snail he'd laboriously worked on the entire morning and half of the afternoon. He'd eaten but a little of his favourite lunch, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. He was that anxious to get back to his work and put on the things that stick out of the head. Proudly, he stood back, small legs spread wide as he watched each flicker of expression on my face. What he'd made resembled nothing more than a lopsided beach ball with trembling feelers. Do you think it's a good snail? he asked, frowning up and looking worried when I couldn't find words to say. Yes, 
I said quickly. It's a wonderful, beautiful snail. You don't think it looks like an orange? No, of course not. Oranges don't have swirls like this snail does, or crooked feelers. Chris stepped closer to view the pitiful creature I held in my hands. You don't call those things feelers, he corrected. A snail is a member of the mollusk family, which have soft bodies without any backbones, and those little things are called antennae, which are connected to its brain. It has tubular intestines that end with its mouth, and it moves by a gear-edged foot. Christopher, I said coolly, when Corrie and I want to know about a snail's tubular intestines, we'll send you a telegram, and please go sit on a tack and wait for it. Do you want to be ignorant all your life? Yes, I flared back. When it comes to snails, I prefer knowing nothing. Corey tagged behind me as we went to watch Carrie pasting pieces of purple paper together. Her working method was slapdash, unlike Corey's careful plodding. Carrie used her pair of scissors to ruthlessly stab a hole into her purple thing. Behind the hole, she pasted a bit of red paper. When she had this thing put together, she named it a worm. It undulated like a giant boa constrictor, flashing a single mean red eye with black spider-leg lashes. Its name is Charlie, she said, handing over her four feet of worm to me. When things came to us without a name of their own, we made their names begin with a C to make them one of us. On the attic walls, in our beautiful garden of paper flowers, we pasted up the epileptic snail beside the fierce and menacing worm. Oh, they did make a pair. Chris sat down and lettered a big sign in red. All animals beware of earthworm. I lettered my own sign, feeling Corey's small snail was the one in jeopardy. Is there a doctor in the house? Corey named this snail Cindy Lou. Mama viewed this day's accomplishments with laughter, all smiles because we were having fun. Yes, of course there is a doctor in the house, she said, and leaned to kiss Chris's cheek. This son of mine has always known what to do for a sick animal. And Cory, I adore your snail. She looks so, so sensitive. Do you like my Charlie? asked Carrie anxiously. I made him good. I used all the purple to make him big. Now we don't have no more purple. It's a beautiful worm, really a gorgeous worm, said Mama, taking the twins onto her lap and giving them the hugs and kisses she sometimes forgot. I especially like the black lashes you put around that red eye. Very effective. It was a cozy, homey scene, the three of them in her chair with Chris perched on the arm, his face close to his mother's. Then I had to go and spoil it all, as was my hateful way. How many words can you type per minute now, Mama? I'm getting better. How much better? I'm doing the best I can, really, Kathy. I told you the keyboard doesn't have any letters. What about shorthand? How fast can you take dictation? I'm trying. You've got to have patience. You don't learn things like that overnight patience. I colored patience gray, hung over with black clouds. I colored hope yellow, just like that sun we could see for a few short morning hours. Too soon the sun rose high in the sky and disappeared from view, leaving us bereft and staring at blue. When you grow up and have a million adult things to do, you forget how long a day can be for a child. It seemed we lived through four years in the course of seven weeks. Then came another dreaded Friday when we had to get up at dawn and scurry around like mad to rid the bedroom and the bathroom of all evidence that we existed. I stripped off the sheets from the bed and rolled them into a ball along with the pillowcases and blankets, and I put the bedspreads directly over the mattress covers, the way the grandmother had ordered me to do. The night before, Chris had taken apart the train tracks, like crazy, we worked to make the room neat, spotless, plus the bathroom. And then the grandmother came in with the picnic basket and ordered us to take it into the attic, and we could eat breakfast there. 
I had most carefully wiped away all our fingerprints, and the mahogany furniture shone. She scowled heavily when she saw this, and darn if she didn't use dust from a vacuum cleaner bag to make all the furniture tops dull again. At seven, we were in the attic schoolroom, eating our cold cereal with raisins and milk. Down below, we could faintly hear the maids moving around in our room. On tippy toes, we moved to the stairwell and huddled there on the top step, listening to what went on below, though we were scared every minute of being discovered. Hearing the maids move about, laughing and chatting, while the grandmother hovered near the closet door, directing them to clean the mirrors, use the lemon wax, air the mattresses, it all gave me the queerest feeling. Why didn't those maids notice something different? Didn't we leave any odor behind? to let them know Cory often wet his bed. It was as if we really didn't exist and weren't alive, and the only scents we had were imaginary. We wrapped our arms about each other and held on to each other tightly, tightly. The maids didn't enter the closet. They didn't open the tall, narrow door. They didn't see us or hear us. Nor did they seem to think it odd the grandmother never left the room for a second while they were in there, scrubbing the tub, cleaning the toilet bowl, scrubbing the tile floor. That Friday did something strange to all of us. I believe we shriveled in our own estimations of ourselves, for afterwards we couldn't find words to say. We didn't enjoy our games or our books, and so silently we cut out tulips and daisies, and waited for Mama to come and bring hope with her again. Still, we were young, and hope has strong roots in the young right down to their toes, and when we entered the attic and saw our growing garden, we could laugh and pretend. After all, we were making our mark in the world. We were making something beautiful out of what had been drab and ugly. Now the twins took off like butterflies fluttering through the mobile flowers, we pushed them high on the swings and created windstorms to shake the flowers madly. We hid behind cardboard trees no taller than Chris and sat on mushrooms made of paper mache with colourful foam cushions on top, which were honestly better than the real thing, unless you had an appetite for eating mushrooms. It's pretty, cried Carrie, spinning around and around, holding to her short, pleated skirt, so we just had to see the new lace ruffled panties Mama had given her yesterday. All new clothes and shoes had to spend their first night with Carrie and Corey in their beds. It's terrible to wake up at night with your cheek resting on the sole of a sneaker. I'm going to be a ballerina too, she said happily, spinning and spinning until she eventually fell, and Corey went rushing to see if she had hurt herself. She screamed to see the blood ooze from a cut on her knee. Oh, I don't want to be a ballerina if it hurts. I didn't dare let her know it hurt. Oh, boy, did it hurt. Yesterdays ago, I'd ambled through real gardens, real forests, and always I felt their mystical aura, as if something magical and marvellous was waiting just around the bend. To make our attic garden enchanted, too, Chris and I crawled around and drew white chalk daisies on the floor, joining them in a ring. Inside that fairy ring of white flowers, all that was evil was banished. There we could sit cross-legged on the floor, and by the light of a single candle burning, Chris and I would spin long, involved tales of good fairies who took care of small children and wicked witches who always went down in defeat. Then Corey spoke up. As always, he was the one to ask the most difficult questions to answer. Where has all the grass gone? God took the grass to heaven. And thusly, Carrie saved me from answering. Why? For Daddy. Daddy likes to mow the lawn. Chris's eyes met with mine, and we'd thought they'd forgotten Daddy. Corey puckered up his faint brows, staring at the little cardboard trees Chris had made. Where are all the big trees? Same place, said Carrie. Daddy likes big trees. This time my eyes took wild flight. 
How I hated lying to them, telling them this was only a game, an endless game they seemed to endure with more patience than Chris or me. And they never once asked why we had to play such a game. Never once did the grandmother come up to the attic to ask what we were doing, though very often she opened the bedroom door as silently as possible, hoping we wouldn't notice the noise of the key turning in the lock. She'd peer in the crack, trying to catch us doing something unholy or wicked. In the attic, we were free to do anything we wanted without fear of retaliation, unless God wielded a whip. Not one time did the grandmother leave our room without reminding us that God was up above to see even when she was not. Because she never went even into the closet to open the door of the attic stairwell, my curiosity was aroused. I reminded myself to ask of Mama as soon as she came in so I wouldn't forget again. Why doesn't the grandmother go into the attic herself and check to see what we do? Why does she just ask and think we'll tell the truth? Tired and dejected-looking, Mama wilted in her special chair. Her new green wool suit looked very expensive. She had been to a hairdresser and the style was changed. She answered my question in an off-hand manner, as if her thoughts were dwelling on something more appealing. Oh, haven't I told you before? Your grandmother suffers from claustrophobia. That's an emotional affliction that makes it difficult for her to breathe in any small, confined area. You see, when she was a child, her parents used to lock her in a closet for punishment. Wow! How difficult to think that large old woman had once been young and small enough to punish. I could almost feel sorry for the child she'd been, but I knew she was happy to see us locked up. Every time she glanced our way, it showed in her eyes, her smug satisfaction to have us so neatly captured. Still, it was a peculiar thing that fate would give her such a fear and thus give Chris and me reason enough to kiss the dear, sweet, close walls of that narrow passageway. Often Chris and I speculated on how all the massive furniture had been taken up into the attic. Certainly it couldn't have been manoeuvred up through the small closet and then up the stairway, which was barely more than a foot wide. And though we searched diligently to find another larger doorway into the attic, we never found one. Maybe one was hidden behind one of the giant armoires too heavy for us to move. Chris thought the largest furniture could have been hauled up to the roof, then passed through one of the big windows. Every day the witch grandmother came into our room to stab with her flintstone eyes, to snarl with her thin, crooked lips. Every day she asked the same old questions. What have you been up to? What do you do in the attic? Did you say grace before today's meals? Did you go down on your knees last night and ask God to forgive your parents for the sin they committed? Are you teaching the youngest two the words of the Lord? Do you use the bathroom together, boys and girls? Boy, did her eyes flash mean then. Are you modest always? Do you keep the private parts of your bodies from the eyes of others? Do you touch your bodies when it's not necessary for cleanliness? God, how dirty she made skin seem. Chris laughed when she was gone. I think she must glue on her underwear, he joked. No, she nails it on, I topped. Have you noticed how much she likes the color gray? Noticed? Who wouldn't notice? Always gray. Sometimes the gray had fine pinstripes of red or blue or a dainty plaid design, very faint or jacquard. But always the fabric was taffeta, with a diamond brooch at the throat of a high and severe neckline, softened a bit by hand-crocheted collars. Mama had already told us a widow lady in the nearest village custom-made these uniforms that looked like armor. This lady is a dear friend of my mother's, and she wears gray because it is cheaper to buy material by the bolt than by the yard and your grandfather owns a mill that makes fine fabrics down in Georgia somewhere. Good golly, even the rich had to be stingy. One September afternoon, I raced down the attic stairs in a terrible hurry to reach the bathroom, and I collided smack into the grandmother. She seized hold of my shoulders and glared down into my face. Watch where you're going, girl, she snapped. Why are you in such a hurry? 
Her fingers felt like steel through the thin fabric of my blue blouse. She had spoken first, so I could answer. Chris is painting the most beautiful landscape, I breathlessly explained, and I've got to get right back with fresh water before his large wash dries. It's important to keep the colors clean. Why doesn't he come for his own water? Why do you wait on him? He's painting, and he asked if I'd mind fetching him fresh water, and I wasn't doing anything but watching, and the twins would spill the water. Fool! Never wait on a man. Make him wait on himself. Now, spill out the truth. What are you really doing up there? Honest, I'm telling the truth. We're working hard to make the attic pretty so the twins won't be afraid up there, and Chris is a wonderful artist. She sneered and asked with contempt, How would you know? He is gifted artistically, Grandmother. All his teachers said so. Has he asked you to pose for him without clothes? I was shocked. No, of course not. Then why are you trembling? I'm... I'm scared of... Of you, I stammered. Every day you come in and ask what sinful, unholy thing we're doing. And truly, I don't know what it is you think we're doing. If you don't tell us exactly, how can we avoid doing something bad, not knowing it is bad? She looked me over, down to my bare feet, and smiled sarcastically. Ask your older brother. He'll know what I mean. The male of the species is born knowing everything evil. Boy, did I blink. Chris wasn't evil or bad. There were times when he was tormenting, but not unholy. I tried to tell her this, but she didn't want to hear. Later on in the day, she came into our room bearing a clay pot of yellow chrysanthemums. Striding directly to me, she put that pot in my hands. Here are real flowers for your fake garden, she said without warmth. It was such an unwitch-like thing for her to do, it took my breath away. Was she going to change, see us differently? Could she learn to like us? I thanked her effusively for the flowers, perhaps too much, for she spun around and stalked out as if embarrassed. Carrie came running to put her small face into the mass of yellow petals. Pretty, she said. Cathy, can I have them? Of course she could have them. With reverence, that pot of flowers was placed on the eastern window sills in the attic to receive the morning sunshine. There was nothing to see but hills and far-off mountains and the trees in between, and above everything hovered a blue mist. The real flowers spent the nights with us, so the twins could wake up in the morning and see something beautiful and alive growing near them. Whenever I think of being young, I see again those blue-misted mountains and hills and the trees that paraded stiffly up and down the slopes. And I smell again the dry and dusty air that was ours to breathe daily. I see again the shadows in the attic that blended so well with the shadows in my mind, and I hear again the unspoken, unanswered questions of why, when, how much longer. Love. I put so much faith in it. Truth. I kept believing it falls always from the lips of the one you love and trust the most. Faith. It's all bound up to love and trust. Where does one end and the other start? And how do you tell when love is the blindest of all? More than two months had passed, and still the grandfather lived on. We stood... We sat, we lay on the wide ledges of the attic dormer windows. We wistfully watched as the treetops of summer's old dark green turned overnight into the brilliant scarlets, golds, oranges and browns of autumn. It moved me, I think it moved all of us, even the twins, to see the summer go away and see the fall begin, and we could only watch but never participate. My thoughts took frantic flight, wanting to escape this prison and seek out the wind so it could fan my hair and sting my skin and make me feel alive again. I yearned for all those children out there who were running wild and free on the browning grass and scuffling their feet in the dry, crackling leaves just as I used to do. Why was it I never realized when I was able to run wild and free that I was experiencing happiness? 
Why did I think back then that happiness was always just ahead in the future, when I would be an adult, able to make my own decisions, go my own way, be my own person? Why had it seemed that being a child was never enough? Why had I thought that happiness reserved itself for those grown to full size? You're looking sad, said Chris, who was crowded close beside me with Corey on the other side of him and Carrie on the other side of me. Nowadays, Carrie was my little shadow to follow where I led and mimic what I did and imitate the way she thought I felt, just as Chris had his small mimicking shadow too in Corey. If there were ever four siblings closer than we were, they would have had to have been Siamese quadruplets. "'Aren't you going to answer me?' asked Chris. "'Why are you looking so sad? "'The trees look beautiful, don't they? "'When it's summer, I like summer best. "'Yet when fall comes, I like fall best. "'And when winter comes, then that's my favourite season. "'And then comes spring, and I think spring is best.' "'Yes, that was my Christopher doll. "'He could make do with the here and now "'and always think it best, no matter what the circumstances.' I was thinking back to old Mrs. Bertram and her boring talk of the Boston Tea Party. She made history seem so dull and the people so unreal. Yet I'd like to be bored like that again. Yeah, he agreed, I know what you mean. I thought school a bore too and history a dull subject, particularly American history, all but the Indians and the Old West. But at least when we were in school we were doing what other kids our ages did, now we're just wasting time doing nothing. Kathy, let's not waste one minute. Let's prepare ourselves for the day we get out. If you don't set your goals firmly in mind and strive always to reach them, then you never do. I'll convince myself if I can't be a doctor, then I won't want to be anything else or want anything more that money can buy. He said that so intensely. I wanted to be a prima ballerina, though I would settle for something else. Chris scowled as if reading my mind. He turned his summer blue eyes on me and scolded because I hadn't practiced my ballet exercises once since I'd come upstairs to exist. Kathy, tomorrow I'm attaching a bar in the portion of the attic we've finished decorating, and five or six hours each day you are going to practice just like in ballet class. I am not... Nobody's going to tell me I have to do anything. Besides, you can't do ballet positions unless you're properly dressed for it. What a stupid thing to say. That's because I am stupid. You, Christopher, have all the brains. With that, I burst into tears and fled from the attic, racing past all the paper flora and fauna. Run, run, run for the stairs fly, fly, fly down the steep and narrow wooden steps, daring fate to make you fall, break a leg, a neck, put you in a coffin dead, make everybody sorry then, make them cry for the dancer I should have been. I threw myself down on my bed and sobbed into the pillow. There was nothing here but dreams, hopes, nothing real. I'd grow old, ugly, never see lots of people again. That old man downstairs could live to be a hundred and ten. All those doctors would keep him living forever. And I would miss out on Halloween. No tricking, no treating, no parties, no candy. Oh, I felt sorry for myself, and I vowed somebody was going to pay, pay, pay for all of this. Somebody was. Somebody was. Wearing their dirty white sneakers, they came to me, my two brothers, my small sister and each sought to give me comfort with small gifts of cherished possessions, Carrie's red and purple crayons, Corey's Peter Rabbit storybook. But Chris, he just sat and looked at me. I never felt so small. One evening, quite late, Mama came in with a large box that she put in my hands to open. There, amidst sheets of white tissue, were ballet costumes, one a bright pink, the other azure blue, with leotards and toe shoes to match the tulle tutus. From Christopher was written on the enclosed small card, and there were records of ballet music. I started to cry as I flung my arms around my mother, then around my brother. This time they weren't tears of frustration or despair. Now I had something to work toward. 
I wanted most of all to buy you a white costume, said Mama, still hugging me. They had a beauty in a size too large to fit you, and with it comes a tight cap of white feathers that curl over your ears for Swan Lake, and I ordered it for you, Kathy. Three costumes should be enough to give you inspiration, shouldn't they? Oh, yes. When Chris had the bar nailed securely to an attic wall, I practiced for hours on end while the music played. There wasn't a large mirror behind the bar like there had been in the classes I had attended, but there was a huge mirror in my mind, and I saw myself as Pavlova, performing before ten thousand enraptured people, and encore after encore I took, bowing and accepting dozens of bouquets, every one red roses. In time, Mama brought me every one of Tchaikovsky's ballets to play on the record player, which had been hooked up to a dozen extension cords which went down the stairs and plugged into a socket in our bedroom. Dancing to beautiful music took me out of myself and made me forget momentarily that life was passing us by. What did it matter when I was dancing? Better to pirouette and pretend I had a partner to support me when I did the most difficult positions. I'd fall, get up, then dance on again until I was out of breath and ached in every muscle and my leotards were glued to me with sweat and my hair was wet. I'd fall down flat on the floor to rest and pant, then up again at the bar to do plies. Sometimes I would be the Princess Aurora in The Sleeping Beauty, and sometimes I'd dance the part of the Prince as well and leap high into the air and beat my feet together. Once I looked up from my concluding dying swan spasms, and I saw Chris standing in the attic shadows watching with the oddest expression on his face. Soon he'd be having a birthday, his fifteenth. How had it come about that already he seemed a man and not a boy? Was it only that vague look in his eyes that said he was moving quickly from childhood? On full point, I performed a sequence of those very small, even steps which are supposed to give the impression the dancer is gliding across the stage and creating what is poetically called a string of pearls. In such a way, I flitter glided over to Chris and held out my arms. Come, Chris, be my danseur. Let me teach you the way. He smiled, seeming bemused, but he shook his head and said that was impossible. Ballet dancing is not for me, but I'd like to learn to waltz, if the music is Strauss. He made me laugh. At that time, the only waltz music we had except ballet were old Strauss records. I hurried over to the record player to take off the Swan Lake records, and I put on the Blue Danube. Chris was clumsy. He held me awkwardly, as if embarrassed. He stepped on my pink point shoes. But it was touching how hard he tried to get simple steps right, and I couldn't tell him all his talents must reside in his brain and in the skill of his artistic hands, for certainly none of it drifted down to his legs and feet. And yet, and yet, there was something sweet and endearing about a Strauss waltz, easy to do and romantic, and so unlike those athletic ballet waltzes that put you in a sweat and left you panting for breath. When Mama finally came through the door with that smashing white outfit for dancing Swan Lake, a beautifully feathered, brief bodice, tight cap, white slippers and white leotard so sheer the pink of my skin showed through, I gasped. Oh, it seemed that love, hope, and happiness could be brought upstairs in one single giant-sized slippery satin white box with a violet ribbon and given to me by someone who really cared when another who really cared put this idea in her head. Dance, ballerina, dance, and do your pirouette in rhythm with your aching heart. Dance, ballerina, dance. You mustn't once forget a dancer has to dance the part. Once you said his love must wait its turn, you wanted fame instead. I guess that's your concern. We live and learn, and love is gone, ballerina, gone. Eventually, Chris could do the waltz and the foxtrot. When I tried to teach him the Charleston, he refused. I don't need to learn every kind of dance like you do. I'm not going to be on stage. 
All I want to learn is how to get out on the dance floor with a girl in my arms and not make a jackass of myself. I'd always been dancing. There wasn't any kind of dance I couldn't do and didn't want to do. Chris, there's one thing you've got to know. You cannot waltz your whole life through or do the foxtrot. Every year brings about changes, like in clothes. You've got to keep up with the times and adapt. Come on, let's jazz it up a bit so you can limber up your creaky joints. That must be going stiff from so much sitting and reading. I stopped waltzing and ran to put on another record. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. I raised my arms and began to gyrate my hips. Rock and roll, Chris. You've got to learn how. Listen to the beat, let go, and learn to swivel your hips like Elvis. Come on, half close your eyes, look sleepy, sexy, and pout your lips. For if you don't, no girl is ever going to love you. Then no girl is ever going to love me. That's the way he said it. Dead flat and dead serious. He would never let anyone force him to do anything that didn't fit his image of himself. And in a way I liked him for being what he was. Strong, resolute, determined to be his own person. Even if his kind of person had long ago gone out of style. My Sir Christopher, the knight gallant. Godlike, we changed the seasons in the attic. We took down the flowers and hung up autumn leaves of brown, russet, scarlet and gold. If we were still here when winter's snowflakes fell, we then substitute lacy white designs that we were all for cutting out in preparation, just in case. We made wild ducks and geese from white, grey and black craft paper and aimed our mobile birds in wide-arrowed skeins heading them south. Birds were easy to make, just elongated ovals with spheres for heads, teardrops with wings. When Chris wasn't sitting with his head stuck in a book, he was painting watercolour scenes of snow-covered hills with lakes where ice skaters skimmed. He put small houses of yellow and pink deeply buried in snow, and smoke curled from the chimneys, and in the distance rose a misty church steeple. And when he was done, he painted all around this a dark window frame. When this was hung on the wall, we had a room with a view. Once, Chris had been a tease I could never please, an older brother. But we changed up there, he and I, just as much as we altered our attic world. We lay side by side on an old mattress, stained and smelly, for hours on end, and talked and talked making plans for the kind of lives we'd live once we were free and rich as Midas. We'd travel around the world. He would meet and fall in love with the most beautiful, sexy woman who was brilliant, understanding, charming, witty, and enormous fun to be with. She'd be the perfect housekeeper, the most faithful of devoted wives, the best of mothers, and she'd never nag or complain or cry or doubt his judgment or be disappointed or discouraged if he made stupid mistakes on the stock market and lost all of their money. She'd understand he'd done his best, and soon he'd make a fortune again with his wits and clever brains. Boy, did he leave me feeling low. How in the world was I ever going to fill the needs of a man like Chris? Somehow or other, I knew he was setting the standard from which I'd judge all my future suitors. Chris, this intelligent, charming, witty, gorgeous woman, can't she have even one little flaw? Why should she have flaws? Take our mother, for instance. You think she is all of those things, except perhaps brilliant. Mama's not stupid, he defended vehemently. She's just grown up in the wrong kind of environment. She was put down as a child and made to feel inferior because she was a girl. As for me, after I'd been a prima ballerina for a number of years and was ready to marry and settle down, I didn't know what kind of man I wanted if he didn't measure up to Chris or my father. I wanted him handsome, I knew that, for I wanted beautiful children. And I wanted him brilliant or I might not respect him. Before I accepted his diamond engagement ring, I'd sit him down to play games. And if I won time and again, I'd smile, shake my head, and tell him to take his ring back to the store. And as we made our plans for the future, our pots of philodendron drooped limp. Our ivy leaves turned yellow before they died. 
We bustled about, giving our plants tender, loving care, talking to them, pleading with them, asking them to please stop looking sick and perk up and straighten up their necks. After all, they were getting the healthiest of all sunlight, that eastern morning light. In a few more weeks, Corrie and Carrie stopped pleading to go outside. No longer did Carrie beat her small fists against the oak door, and Corrie stopped trying to kick it down with his ineffectual small feet, wearing only soft sneakers that didn't keep his small toes from bruising. They now docilely accepted what before they denied. The attic garden was the only outside available to them. And, in time, pitiful as it was, they soon forgot there was a world other than the one we were locked up in. Chris and I had dragged several old mattresses close to the eastern windows, so we could open the windows wide and sunbathe in the beneficial rays that didn't have to pass through dirty window glass first. Children needed sunlight in order to grow. All we had to do was look at our dying plants and register what the attic air was doing to our greenery. Unabashedly, we stripped off all our clothes and sunbathed in the short time the sun visited our windows. We saw each other's differences and thought little about them, and frankly told Mama what we did so we too wouldn't die from lack of sunlight. She glanced from Chris to me and weakly smiled. It's all right, but don't let your grandmother know. She wouldn't approve, as you well know. I now know that she looked at Chris and then at me for signs to indicate our innocence or our awakening sexuality, and what she saw must have given us some assurance we were still only children, though she should have known better. The twins loved to be naked and play as babies. They laughed and giggled when they used terms such as doo-doo and twiddle-dee, and enjoyed looking at the places where doo-doo came from and wondered why Corey's twiddle-dee maker was so different from Carrie's. Why, Chris? asked Carrie, pointing at what he had and Corey had and she and I didn't have. I went right on reading Wuthering Heights and tried to ignore such silly talk. But Chris tried to give an answer that was correct as well as truthful. All male creatures have their sexual organs on the outside and females have theirs tucked away inside. Neatly inside, I said. Yes, Kathy, I know you approve of your neat body, and I approve of my unneat body. So let all of us rejoice that we have what we do. Our parents accepted our bare skins, just as they did our eyes and hair, and so shall we. And I forgot. Male birds have their organs neatly tucked away inside, too, like females. Intrigued, I asked, How do you know? I just know. You read it in a book? What else? Do you think I caught a bird and examined it? I wouldn't put it past you. At least I read to improve my brain, not just to entertain it. You're going to make a very dull man, I'm warning. And if a male bird has tucked away sexual organs, doesn't that make him a her? No. But, Christopher, I don't understand why are birds different. They have to be streamlined in order to fly. It was another of those puzzlements, and he had the answers. I just knew the brain of brains had the answers. All right, but why are male birds made the way they are and leave out the streamline part? He floundered. His face turned deeply red, and he sought a way to say something delicately. Male birds can be aroused, and that makes what is in come out. How are they aroused? Shut up and read your book, and let me read mine. Some days were too chilly for sunbathing. Then it grew frigid, so even wearing our heaviest and warmest clothes, we still shivered unless we ran. Too soon the morning sun stole away from the east, leaving us desolate and wishing there were windows on the southern side, but the windows were shuttered over and locked. It doesn't matter, said Mama. The morning sun is the healthiest words that didn't cheer us, since our plants were dying one by one while living in the healthiest sunlight of all. As November began, the attic began to turn arctic cold. Our teeth chattered, our noses ran, 
We sneezed often and complained to Mama that we needed a stove with a chimney since the two stoves in the schoolroom had been disconnected. Mama spoke of bringing up an electric or gas heater, but she feared an electric stove might start a fire if connected to many extension cords, and a chimney was also needed for a gas heater. She brought us long, heavy underwear and thick ski jackets with attached hoods and bright ski pants with wool fleece lining. Wearing these clothes, we went daily into the attic, where we could run free and escape the grandmother's ever-observant eyes. In our cluttered bedroom, we barely had room to walk without colliding into something to bruise our shins. In the attic, we went frantic, screaming as we chased one another, hiding, finding, putting on small plays with frenzied activity. We fought sometimes, argued, cried, then went back to fierce play. We had a passion for hide-and-seek. Chris and I enjoyed making this game terribly threatening, but only mildly so for the twins, who were already terrified enough of the many bad things that lingered in the dark attic shadows. Carrie earnestly said she saw monsters hiding behind the shrouded furniture. One day we were up in the attic polar zone and searching to find Corey. I'm going downstairs, said Carrie, her small face resentful, her lips pouted. No good to try and make her stay in exercise, she was too stubborn. She sashayed off in her little red ski outfit, leaving me and Chris to hunt around to find Corey. Customarily, he was just too easy to find. His way was to choose the last place Chris had hidden. So it was our belief we could go straight to the third massive armoire, and there would be Corey crouched down on the floor, hiding under the old clothes and grinning up at us. We indulged him, avoiding this particular wardrobe for a specific length of time. Then we decided to find him. And lo, when we looked, he wasn't there. Well, I'll be damned! exclaimed Chris. He's finally going to be innovative and find an original place to hide. That's what came of reading so many books. Big words stuck to his brains. I swiped at my leaky nose and then took another look around. If truly innovative, there were a million good hiding places in this multi-winged attic. Why, it might take us hours and hours to find Corey. And I was cold, tired and irritable, sick of playing this game Chris insisted on daily to keep us active. Corey, I yelled. Come out from wherever you are. It's time to eat lunch. Now that should bring him. Meals were a cosy and homey thing to do, and they broke up our long days into separate portions. Still he didn't answer. I flashed angry eyes at Chris. Peanut butter and grape jelly sandwiches, I added. Corey's favourite meal, which should bring him running. Still not a sound, not a cry, nothing. Suddenly I was scared. I couldn't believe Corey had overcome his fear of the immense shadowy attic and was at last taking the game seriously. But just suppose he was trying to imitate Chris or me. Oh, God! Chris, I cried, we've got to find Corey and fast! He caught my panic and whirled about to run, crying out Corey's name, ordering him to come out, stop hiding. Both of us ran and hunted, calling Corey repeatedly. Hide and seek time was over, lunch time now. No answer, and I was nearly freezing despite all my clothes. Even my hands looked blue. Oh, my God, murmured Chris, pulling up short. Just suppose he hid in one of the trunks and the lid came down and accidentally latched. Corey would suffocate. He'd die. Like crazy, we ran and looked, throwing open the lids of every old trunk. We tossed out pantaloons, shifts, camisoles, petticoats, stays, suits, all with insane, distressed terror. And while I ran and searched, I prayed over and over again for God not to let Corey die. Kathy, I found him! shouted Chris. I spun around to see Chris lifting Corey's small, inert form from a trunk that had latched and kept him inside. Weak with relief, I stumbled over and kissed Corey's small, pale face, turned a funny colour from lack of oxygen. His slitted eyes were unfocused. He was very nearly unconscious. Mama, he whispered, I want my mama. 
but Mama was miles away learning how to type and take shorthand. There was only a pitiless grandmother we didn't know how to reach in an emergency. Run quick and fill the bathtub with hot water, said Chris, but not too hot. We don't want to scald him. Then he was racing with Corey in his arms toward the stairwell. I reached the bedroom first, then sped on toward the bath. I glanced backward to see Chris lay Corey down on his bed. Then he bent above, held Corey's nostrils, and then Chris lowered his head until his mouth covered Corey's blue lips, which were spread apart. My heart jumped. Was he dead? Had he stopped breathing? Carrie took one glance at what was going on, her small twin blue and not moving, and she began to scream. In the bathroom I turned on both faucets as far as they would go. Full blast they gushed. Corey was going to die. Always I was dreaming of death and dying, and most of the times my dreams came true. And, as always, just when I thought God had turned his back on us and didn't care, I whirled to grab hold of my faith and prayed, demanding him not to let Corey die. Please, God, please, God, please, please, please. Maybe my desperate prayers did as much to help Corey back to life as the artificial resuscitation Chris performed. He's breathing again, said Chris, pale-faced and trembling as he carried Corey to the tub. Now all we have to do is warm him up. In no time at all we had Corey undressed and in the tub of warm water. Mama, whispered Corey as he came to. I want Mama. Over and over again he kept saying it, and I could have pounded my fists through the walls. It was so damned unfair. He should have his mother, and not just a pretend mother who didn't know what to do. I wanted out of this, even if I had to beg in the streets. But I said, in a calm way that made Chris lift his head and smile at me with approval, Why can't you pretend I'm Mama? I'll do everything for you that she would. I'll hold you on my lap and rock you to sleep while I sing you a lullaby, just as soon as you eat a little lunch and drink some milk. Both Chris and I were kneeling as I said this. He was massaging Corey's small feet while I rubbed his cold hands and made them warm again. When his flesh was coloured normally again, we dried Corey off, put on his warmest pyjamas, wrapped him in a blanket, and in the old rocker Chris had brought down from the attic, I sat down and cuddled my small brother on my lap. I covered his wan face with kisses and whispered sweet nothings in his ear that made him giggle. If he could laugh, he could eat, and I fed him tiny bits of sandwich and gave him sips of lukewarm soup and long drinks of milk. And as I did this, I grew older. Ten years I aged in ten minutes. I glanced over at Chris as he sat down to eat his lunch and saw that he too had changed. Now we knew there was real danger in the attic, beyond that of slow withering from lack of sunlight and fresh air. We all faced threats much worse than the mice and spiders that insisted on living despite all we did to kill every last one. All alone, Chris stalked up the narrow, steep stairs to the attic, his face grim as he entered the closet. I rocked on and on, holding both Carrie and Corey on my lap and singing rock baby Suddenly there was a fierce hammering coming from above, a terrible clamour the servants might hear. Kathy, said Corey in a small whisper while Carrie nodded off into sleep. I don't like not having a mama any more. You do have a mama. You have me. Are you as good as a real mama? Yes, I think I am. I love you very much, Corey, and that's what makes a real mother. Corey stared up at me with wide blue eyes to see if I was sincere or if I were only mocking his need. Then his small arms crept up around my neck and he cuddled his head on my shoulder. I'm so sleepy, Mama, but don't stop singing. I was still rocking, still singing softly when Chris came back, wearing a satisfied expression. Never again will a trunk lock inadvertently, he said. For I smashed every last lock, and the wardrobes, now they won't lock either. I nodded. 
He sat on the nearest bed and watched the slow rhythm of the rocking chair, listening to the childish tune I kept right on singing. A slow flush heated his face, so he seemed embarrassed. I feel so left out, Kathy. Would it be all right if I sat in the rocker first, and then the three of you piled on? Daddy used to do that. He'd hold all of us on his lap, even Mama. His arms had been long enough and strong enough to embrace us all and give us the nicest, warmest feeling of security and love. I wondered if Chris could do the same. As we sat in the rocker with Chris underneath, I caught a glimpse of us in the dresser mirror across the way. An eerie feeling stole over me, making all of this seem so unreal. He and I looked like doll parents, younger editions of Mama and Daddy. The Bible says there is a time for everything, whispered Chris, so as not to awaken the twins. A time to be born, a time to plant, a time to harvest, a time to die, and so on. And this is our time to sacrifice. Later on will come our time to live and enjoy. I turned my head and nestled it down on his boyish shoulder, grateful he was always so optimistic, always so cheerful. It felt good to have his strong young arms about me, almost as protective and good as Daddy's arms had been. Chris was right, too. Our happy time would come the day we left this room and went downstairs to attend a funeral. Chapter 9 Holidays On the tall stalk of the Amaryllis, a single bud appeared, a living calendar to remind us that Thanksgiving and Christmas were drawing nigh. It was our only plant alive now, and it was by far our most cherished possession. We carried it down from the attic to spend warm nights with us in the bedroom. Up first every morning, Corey rushed to see the bud, wanting to know if it had survived the night. Then Carrie would shortly follow him to stand close at his side and admire a hardy plant, valiant, victorious, where others had failed. They checked the wall calendar to see if a day was encircled with green, indicating the plant needed to be fertilized. They felt the dirt to see if it needed water. They never trusted their own judgment, but would come to me and ask, Should we give Amaryllis water? Do you think she's thirsty? We never owned anything, inanimate or alive, that we didn't name, and Amaryllis was determined to live. Neither Corey nor Carrie would trust their frail strength to carry the heavy pot up to the attic windows, where the sunshine lingered but shortly. I was allowed to carry Amaryllis up, but Chris had to bring her down at night. And each night we took turns marking off a day with a big red X. We now had crossed off one hundred days. The cold rains came, the fierce winds blew, sometimes heavy fog shut out the morning sunlight. The dry branches of the trees scraped the house at night and woke me up, making me suck in my breath, waiting, waiting waiting for some horror to come in and eat me up. On a day when it was pouring rain that might later turn into snow, Mama came breathless into our bedroom, bringing with her a box of pretty party decorations to put on our Thanksgiving Day table and make it festive. She had included a bright yellow tablecloth and orange linen napkins with fringe. We are having guests tomorrow for a midday dinner, she explained dumping her box on the bed nearest the door and already turning to leave. And two turkeys are being roasted, one for us, one for the servants. But they won't be ready early enough for your grandmother to put in the picnic basket. Now don't worry, I'm not allowing my children to live through a Thanksgiving day without a feast to fit the occasion. Somehow I'll find a way to slip up some hot food, a little bit of everything we have. I think I'll make a big to-do about wanting to serve my father myself, and while I'm preparing his tray, I can put food on another tray to bring up to you. Expect to see me about one tomorrow. Like the wind through the door, she blew in, blew out, leaving us with happy anticipations of a huge, hot Thanksgiving Day meal. Carrie asked, What's Thanksgiving? Corey answered, same as saying grace before meals. In a way, he was right, I think. 
and since he'd said something voluntarily, darned if I was going to squelch him by any criticism. While Chris cuddled the twins on his lap, sitting in one of the big lounge chairs, and told them of the first Thanksgiving day so long ago, I bustled about like any housefrau, very happy to set a festive holiday table. Our place cards were four small turkeys with tails that fanned out to make orange and yellow honeycombed paper plumage. We had two big pumpkin candles to burn, two pilgrim men, two pilgrim women, and two Indian candles. But darned if I could light such pretty candles and see them melt down into puddles. I put plain candles on the table to light and saved the costly candles for other Thanksgiving Day meals when we were out of this place. On our little turkeys I carefully lettered our names, then fanned them open and placed one of them before each plate. Our dining table had a small shelf underneath, and that's where we kept our dishes and silverware. After each meal I washed them in the bathroom in a pink plastic basin. Chris dried, then stacked the dishes in a rubber rack under the table to await the next meal. I laid out the silverware most carefully, forks to the left, the knives to the right, blades facing the plates, and next to the knives the spoons. Our china was Lennox, with a wide blue rim and edged in twenty-four carat gold. All that was written on the back. Mama had already told me this was old dinnerware that the servants wouldn't miss. Our crystal today was footed, and I couldn't help but stand back to admire my own artistry. The only thing missing was flowers. Mama should have remembered to bring flowers. One o'clock came and went. Carrie complained loudly. Let's eat our lunch now, Kathy. Be patient. Mama is bringing us special hot food, turkey and all the fixings, and this will be dinner, not lunch. My housewifely chores done for a while, I curled up happily on the bed to read more of Lorna Doone. Kathy... "'My stomach don't have patience,' said Corey now, bringing me back from the mid-seventeenth century. Chris was deep into some Sherlock Holmes mystery that would be solved fast on the last page. "'Wouldn't it be wonderful if the twins could calm their stomachs, capacity about two ounces, by reading, as Chris and I did? "'Eat a couple of raisins, Corey. "'Don't have no more.' "'The correct way to say that is... I don't have any more, or there aren't any more. Don't have no more, honest. Eat a peanut. Peanuts are all gone. Did I say that right? Yes, I sighed. Eat a cracker. Carrie ate the last cracker. Carrie, why didn't you share those crackers with your brother? He didn't want none then. Two o'clock. Now all of us were starving. We had trained our stomachs to eat at twelve o'clock sharp. Whatever was keeping Mama? Was she going to eat first herself and then bring us our food? She hadn't told it that way. A little after three o'clock, Mama rushed in bearing a huge silver tray laden with covered dishes. She wore a dress of periwinkle blue wool jersey, and her hair was waved back from her face and caught low at the nape of her neck with a silver barrette, Boy, did she look pretty. I know you're starving, she immediately began to apologize. But my father changed his mind and decided at the last minute to use his wheelchair and eat with the rest of us. She threw us a harried smile. Your table setting is lovely, Kathy. You did everything just right. I'm sorry I forgot the flowers. I shouldn't have forgotten. We have nine guests, all busy talking to me and asking a thousand questions about where I was for so long. And you just don't know the trouble I had slipping into the butler's pantry when John wasn't looking. That man has eyes in back of his head. And you never saw anyone hop up and down as much as I did. The guests must have thought I was very impolite or just plain foolish. But I did manage to fill your dishes and hide them away. Then back to the dining table I'd dash and smile and eat a bite before I had to get up again to blow my nose in another room. I answered three telephone calls that I made to myself from the private line in my bedroom. I had to disguise my voice so no one would guess. And I really did want to bring you slices of pumpkin pie. 
But John had it sliced and already put on the dessert plate, so what could I do? He'd have noticed four missing pieces. She blew us a kiss, bestowed a dazzling but hurried smile, and disappeared out the door. Good golly day, we sure did complicate her life, all right. We rushed to the table to eat. Chris bowed his head to say a hasty grace that couldn't have impressed God very much on this day of all days, when his ears must ring with more eloquent phrasing. Thank you, Lord, for this belated Thanksgiving Day meal. Amen. Inwardly I smiled, for it was so like Chris to get directly to the point, and that was to play host and dish up the food onto the plates we handed him one by one. He gave finicky and picky one slice of white turkey meat apiece, and tiny portions of the vegetables, and to each a salad that had been shaped in a pretty mould. The medium-sized portions were mine, and, of course, he served himself last, huge amounts for the one who needed it most, the brain. Chris appeared ravenous. He forked into his mouth huge gobs of mashed potatoes that were almost cold. Everything was on the verge of being cold, the gelatin salad was beginning to soften, and the lettuce beneath it was wilted. We don't like cold food, Carrie wailed, as she stared down at her pretty plate with such dainty portions placed neatly in a circle. One thing you could say for Chris, he was precise. You would have thought Miss Picky was looking at snakes and worms from the way she scowled at that plate, and Mr. Finicky duplicated his twin's sour expression of distaste. Honestly, I felt kind of sorry for Mama, who had tried so hard to bring us up a really good hot meal, and messed up her own meal in the process, making herself look silly in front of the guests, too. And now those two weren't going to eat anything. After three hours of complaining and telling us how hungry they were, kids. The egghead across the way closed his eyes to savour the delight of having something different, deliciously prepared food and not the hasty picnic junk thrown together in a hurry before six o'clock in the morning. Although, to be fair to the grandmother, she didn't ever forget us. She must have had to get up in the dark to beat the chef and the maids into the kitchen. Chris then did something that really shocked me. He knew better than to stab into a huge slice of white turkey meat and shove the whole slice into his mouth. What was the matter with him? Don't eat like that, Chris. It sets a bad example for you-know-who. They aren't watching me, he said with a mouthful, and I'm starving. I've never been so hungry before in my whole life, and everything tastes so good. Daintily, I cut my turkey into small bits and put some in my mouth to show the hog across the way how it was properly done. I swallowed first, then said, I pity the wife you'll have. She'll divorce you within a year. He went on eating, deaf and dumb to everything but enjoyment. Kathy, said Carrie, don't be mean to Chris, cause we don't like cold food anyway, so we don't want to eat. My wife will adore me so much she'll be charmed to pick up my dirty socks. And Carrie, you and Cory like cold cereal with raisins, so eat. We don't like cold turkey, and that brown stuff on the potatoes looks funny. That brown stuff is called gravy, and it tastes delicious, and Eskimos love cold food. Kathy, do Eskimos like cold food? I don't know, Carrie. I suppose they'd better like it or starve to death. For the life of me, I couldn't understand what Eskimos had to do with Thanksgiving. Chris, couldn't you have said something better? Why bring up Eskimos? Eskimos are Indians. Indians are part of the Thanksgiving Day tradition. Oh. You know, of course, the North American continent used to be connected with Asia, he said between mouthfuls. Indians trekked over from Asia, and some liked ice and snow so much they just stayed on, while others had better sense and moved on down. Kathy... What's this lumpy and bumpy stuff that looks like jello? It's cranberry salad. The lumps are whole cranberries, the bumps are pecan nuts, and the white stuff is sour cream. And boy, was it good. 
It had bits of pineapple, too. We don't like lumpy, bumpy stuff. Carrie, said Chris, I get tired of what you like and don't like. Eat. Your brother is right, Carrie. Cranberries are delicious and so are nuts. Birds love to eat berries and you like birds, don't you? Birds don't eat berries. They eat dead spiders and other bugs. We saw them, we did. They picked them out of the gutters and ate them without chewing. We can't eat what birds eat. Shut up and eat, said Chris with a mouthful. Here we were with the best food, even if it was almost cold, since we'd come upstairs to live in this hateful house, and all the twins could do was stare down at their plates, and so far hadn't eaten a single bite. And Chris, he was demolishing everything in sight, like the prize-winning hog at the county fair. The twins tasted the mashed potatoes with the mushroom gravy. The potatoes were grainy, and the gravy was funny. They tasted the absolutely divine stuffing and declared that lumpy, grainy, and funny. Eat the sweet potatoes, then, I almost yelled. Look at how pretty they are. They're smooth because they've been whipped and marshmallows have been added, and you love marshmallows and it's flavored with orange and lemon juice. And pray to God they didn't notice the lumpy pecans. I guess between the two of them, sitting across from one another, fussily stirring the food into mishmash, they managed to put away three or four ounces of food. While Chris was longing for dessert, pumpkin pie or mincemeat pie, I began to clear away the table. Then, for some reason extraordinaire, Chris began to help. I couldn't believe it. He smiled at me disarmingly and even kissed my cheeks. And boy, if good food could do that for a man, I was all for learning gourmet cooking. He even picked up his socks before he came to help me wash and dry the dishes, glasses, and silverware. Ten minutes after Chris and I had everything neatly stored away under the table and covered over with the clean towel, the twins simultaneously announced, We're hungry. Our stomachs hurt. Chris read on at his desk. I got up from the bed after laying aside Lorna Doon, and without saying one word, I gave to each of the twins a peanut butter and jelly sandwich from the picnic basket. As they ate, taking tiny bites, I threw myself down on the bed and watched them with real puzzlement. Why did they enjoy that junk? Being a parent wasn't as easy as I used to presume, nor was it such a delight. Don't sit on the floor, Corey. It's colder down there than in a chair. Don't like chairs, said Corey. Then he sneezed. The very next day, Corey came down with a severe cold. His small face was red and hot. He complained that he ached all over and his bones hurt. Kathy, where is my mama, my real mama? Oh, how he wanted his mother. Finally, she did show up. Immediately she became anxious as she viewed Corey's flushed face, and she rushed away to fetch a thermometer. Unhappily she returned, trailed by the detested grandmother. With the slim stem of glass in his mouth, Corey stared up at his mother as if at a golden angel come to save him in his time of distress, and I, his pretend mother, was forgotten. Sweetheart, darling baby, she crooned and she picked him up from the bed and carried him to the rocker where she sat down to put kisses on his brow. I'm here, darling. I love you. I'll take care of you and make the pains go away. Just eat your meals and drink your orange juice like a good little boy and soon you'll be well. She put him to bed again and hovered over him before she popped an aspirin into his mouth and gave him water to swallow it down. Her blue eyes were misted over with troubled tears, and her slim white hands worked nervously. I narrowed my eyes as I watched her eyes close and her lips move as if in silent prayer. Two days later, Carrie was in the bed beside Corey, sneezing and coughing too, and her temperature raged upward with terrifying swiftness, enough to panic me. Chris looked scared too. Listless and pale, the two of them lay side by side in the big bed, with little fingers clutching the covers high under their rounded chins. They seemed made of porcelain, they were so waxy white, 
and their blue eyes grew larger and larger as they sank deeper and deeper into their skulls. Dark shadows came under their eyes to make them seem haunted children. When our mother wasn't there, those two sets of eyes pleaded mutely with Chris and me to do something, anything, to make the misery go away. Mama took a week off from the secretarial school so she could be with her twins as much as possible. I hated it that the grandmother felt it so necessary to trail after her every time she showed up, always putting her nose in where it didn't belong, and her advice when we didn't want her advice. Already she told us we didn't exist and had no right to be alive on God's earth, save for those saintly and pure like herself. Did she come merely to distress us more and take from us the comfort of having our mother to ourselves? The whisper of her menacing grey dresses, the sound of her voice, the tread of her heavy feet, the sight of her huge pale hands, soft and puffy, flashing with diamond rings and spotted brown with dyeing pigment. Oh, yes, just to see her was to loathe her. Then there was our mother rushing to us off and doing what she could to help the twins back to health. Shadows were under her eyes, too, as she gave the twins aspirins and water, and later on orange juice and hot chicken soup. One morning, Mama rushed in, carrying a big thermos of orange juice she had just squeezed. It's better than the frozen or canned kind, she explained, full of vitamin C and A, and that's good for colds. Next, she listed what she wanted Chris and me to do, saying that Chris and I were to give orange juice often. We stored the thermos on the attic steps, as good as any refrigerator in the winter time. One glance at the thermometer from Carrie's lips and a frenzied panic blew away all of Mama's cool. Oh, God, she cried out in distress. 103.6. I have to take them to a doctor, a hospital. I was before the heavy dresser, holding to it lightly with one hand and exercising my legs, as I did each day now that the attic was too cold to limber up in. I threw my grandmother a quick glance, trying to read her reactions to this. The grandmother had no patience for those who lost control and made waves. Don't be ridiculous, Corinne. All children run high fevers when they are sick. Doesn't mean a thing. You should know that by now. A cold is just a cold. Chris jerked his head up from the book he was pursuing. He believed the twins had the flu, though how they had caught the virus he couldn't guess. The grandmother continued, Doctors, what do they know about curing a cold? We know just as much. There are only three things to do. Stay in bed, drink lots of liquids, and take aspirins. What else? And aren't we doing all of those things? She flashed me a mean look. Stop swinging your legs, girl. You make me nervous. Again she directed her eyes and her words at our mother. Now, my mother had a saying, colds take three days coming, three days staying, and three days leaving. What if they have the flu? asked Chris. The grandmother turned her back and ignored his question. She didn't like his face. He resembled our father too much. I hate it when people who should know better question those who are older and far wiser. Everyone knows the rule for colds. Six days to start and stay and three days to leave. That's the way it is. They'll recover. As the grandmother predicted, the twins recovered. Not in nine days, in nineteen days. Only bed rest, aspirins and fluids did the trick. No prescriptions from a doctor to help them back to health more quickly. By day, the twins stayed in the same bed. By night, Carrie slept with me and Corey with his brother. I don't know why Chris and I didn't come down with the same thing. All night long, we jumped up and down to run for water, for orange juice kept cold on the attic stairs. They cried for cookies, for mama, for something to unstop their nostrils. They tossed and fretted, weak and uneasy, worried by bothersome things they couldn't express except by large, fearful eyes that tore at my heart. They asked questions while they were sick that they didn't ask while they were well. And wasn't that odd? Why do we stay upstairs all the time? Has downstairs gone away? Did it go where the sun hides? Don't Mama like us no more? Any more, I corrected. Why are the walls fuzzy? Are they fuzzy? I asked in return. Chris, he looks fuzzy too. 
Chris is tired. Are you tired, Chris? Kinda. I'd like for you both to go to sleep and stop asking so many questions. And Kathy is tired, too. We'd both like to go to sleep and know the two of you are sleeping soundly, too. We don't sound when we sleep. Chris sighed, picked up Corey, and carried him over to the rocker, and soon Carrie and I were seated on his lap. There we rocked back and forth, back and forth, telling stories at three o'clock in the morning. We read stories on other nights till four in the morning. If they cried and wanted Mama, as they incessantly did, Chris and I acted as mother and father and did what we could to soothe them with soft lullabies. We rocked so much the floorboards started to creak, and surely below someone could have heard. And all the while we heard the wind blowing through the hills. It scraped the skeleton tree branches and squeaked the house and whispered of death and dying, and in the cracks and crevices it howled, moaned, sobbed, and sought in all ways to make us aware we weren't safe. We read so much aloud, sang so much, both Chris and I grew hoarse and half sick ourselves from fatigue. We prayed every night down on our knees, asking God to make our twins well again. Please, God, give them back to us the way they were. A day came when the coughing eased and sleepless eyelids drooped and eventually closed in peaceful sleep. The cold, bony hands of death had reached for our little ones and was reluctant to let go, for so tortuously, slowly, the twins drifted back to health. When they were well, they were not the same robust, lively pair. Corey, who had said little before, now said even less. Carrie, who had adored the sound of her own constant chatter, now became almost as truculent as Corey. And now that I had the quiet I so often longed for, I wanted back the bird-like chit-chat that rattled on incessantly to dolls, trucks, trains, boats, pillows, plants, shoes, dresses, underpants, toys, puzzles, and games. I checked her tongue, and it seemed pale and white. Fearfully, I straightened to gaze down on two small faces side by side on one pillow. Why had I wanted them to grow up and act their proper ages? This long illness had brought about instant age. It put dark circles under their large blue eyes and stole their healthy color. The high temperatures and the coughing had left them with a wise look, a sometimes sly look of the old, the tired, the ones who just lay and didn't care if the sun came up or if it went down and stayed down. They scared me. Their haunted faces took me into dreams of death. And all the while the wind kept blowing. Eventually they left their beds and walked about slowly. Legs once so plump and rosy and able to hop, jump and skip were now as weak as thin straws. Now they were inclined to only creep instead of fly and smile instead of laugh. Wearily I fell face down on my bed and thought and thought and thought. What could Chris and I do to restore their babyish charm? There was nothing either he or I could do though we would have given our health to restore theirs. Vitamins, proclaimed Mama, when Chris and I took pains to point out the unhealthy differences in our twins. Vitamins are exactly what they need, and what you two need as well. From now on, each one of you must take a daily vitamin capsule. Even as she said this, her slim and elegant hand rose to fluff the glory of her beautifully coiffed shining hair. "'Does fresh air and sunshine come in capsules?' I asked, perching on a nearby bed and glaring hard at a mother who refused to see what was wrong. "'When each of us has swallowed a vitamin capsule a day, will that give to us the radiant good health we had when we lived normal lives and spent most of our days outside?' Mama was wearing pink. She did look lovely in pink. It put roses in her cheeks and her hair glowed with rosy warmth. Kathy, she said, tossing me a patronizing glance while she moved to hide her hands. Why do you incessantly persist in making everything so hard for me? I do the best I can, really I do. And yes, if you want the truth, in vitamins you can swallow the good health the outdoors bestows. That is exactly the reason so many vitamins are made. 
Her indifference put more pain in my heart. My eyes flashed over to Chris, who had bowed his head low, taking all this in, but saying nothing. How long is our imprisonment going to last, Mama? A short while, Cathy, only a short while longer. Believe that. Another month? Possibly. Could you manage somehow to sneak up here and take the twins outside, say, for a ride in your car? You could plan it so the servants wouldn't see. I think it would make an immense amount of difference. Chris and I don't have to go. She spun around and glanced at my elder brother to see if he were in this plot with me, but surprise was a dead giveaway on his face. No, of course not. I can't take a risk like that. Eight servants work in this house, and though their quarters are quite cut off from the main house, there is always someone looking out a window, and they would hear me start up the car. Being curious, they'd look to see which direction I took. My voice turned cold. Then would you please see if you could manage to bring up fresh fruit, especially bananas? You know how the twins love bananas, and they haven't had one since we came. Tomorrow I'll bring bananas. Your grandfather doesn't like them. What has he got to do with it? It's the reason bananas are not purchased. You drive back and forth to secretarial school every weekday. Stop yourself and buy the bananas and more peanuts and raisins. And why can't they have a box of popcorn once in a while? Certainly that won't rot their teeth. Pleasantly, she nodded and verbally agreed. And what would you like for yourself? She asked. Freedom. I want to be let out. I'm tired of being in a locked room. I want the twins out. I want Chris out. I want you to rent a house, buy a house, steal a house, but get us out of this house. Kathy, she began to plead, I'm doing the best I can. Don't I bring you gifts every time I come through the door? What is it you lack besides bananas? Name it. You promised we'd stay up here but a short while, and it's been months. She spread her hands in a supplicating gesture. Do you expect me to kill my father? Numbly, I shook my head. You leave her alone, Chris exploded the moment the door closed behind his goddess. She does try to do the best she can by us. Stop picking on her. It's a wonder she comes to see us at all, what with you riding her back with your everlasting questions like you don't trust her. How do you know how much she suffers? Do you believe she's happy, knowing her four children are locked in one room and left to play in an attic? It was hard to tell about someone like our mother just what she was thinking and what she was feeling. Her expression was always calm, unruffled, though she often appeared tired. If her clothes were new and expensive, and we seldom saw her wear the same thing twice, she brought us many new and expensive clothes too. Not that it mattered what we wore. Nobody saw us but the grandmother, and we could have worn rags, which indeed might have put a smile of pleasure on her face. We didn't go up to the attic when it rained or when it snowed. Even on clear days, there was that wind to snarl fiercely as it blew, screaming and tearing through the cracks of the old house. One night, Corey woke up and called to me. Make the wind go away, Kathy. I left my bed and Carrie, who was fast asleep on her side, crawled under the covers beside Corey and tightly I held him in my arms. Poor little thin body wanting to be loved so much by his real mother, and he had only me. He felt too small, so fragile, as if that rampaging wind could blow him away. I lowered my face into his clean, sweet-smelling, curly, blonde hair, and kissed him there, as I had when he was a baby and I had replaced my dolls with living babies. I can't make the wind go away, Corey. Only God can do that. And tell God I don't like the wind, he said sleepily. Tell God the wind wants to come in and get me. I gathered him closer, held him tighter. Never going to let the wind take Corey away, never. But I knew what he meant. Tell me a story, Kathy, so I can forget the wind. There was a favorite story I had concocted to please Corey 
all about a fantasy world where little children lived in a small, cosy home with a mother and father who were much, much bigger and powerful enough to scare away frightening things. A family of six, with a garden out in back, where giant trees held swings and where real flowers grew, the kind that knew how to die in the fall and how to come up again in the spring. There was a pet dog named Clover, and a cat named Calico, and a yellow bird sang in a golden cage all day long, and everybody loved everybody, and nobody was ever whipped, spanked, yelled at, nor were any of the doors locked, nor the draperies closed. Sing me a song, Kathy. I like it when you sing me to sleep. I held him snugly in my arms and began to sing lyrics I had written myself to music I had heard Corey hum over and over again, his own mind music. It was a song meant to take away from him his fear of the wind, and perhaps take from me my fears, too. It was my very first attempt to rhyme. I hear the wind when it sweeps down from the hill. It speaks to me when the night is still. It whispers in my ear the words I never hear, even when he's near. I feel the breeze when it blows in from the sea. It lifts my hair, it caresses me. It never takes my hand to show it understands. It never touches me tenderly. Some day I know I'm gonna climb this hill. I'll find another day, some other voice to say the words I've got to hear, if I'm to live another year. And my little one was asleep in my arms, breathing evenly, feeling safe. Beyond his head, Chris lay, with his eyes wide open, fixed upward on the ceiling. When my song was over, he turned his head and met my eyes. His fifteenth birthday had come and gone, with a bakery cake and ice cream to mark the occasion as special. Gifts. They came every day, almost. Now we had a Polaroid camera, a new and better watch. Great. Wonderful. How could he be so easily pleased? Didn't he see our mother wasn't the same any more? Didn't he notice she no longer came every day? Was he so gullible he believed everything she said, every excuse she made? Christmas Eve We had been five months at Foxworth Hall. Not once had we been down into the lower sections of this enormous house, much less to the outside. We kept to the rules, we said grace before every meal, we knelt and said prayers beside our beds every night, we were modest in the bathroom, we kept our thoughts clean, pure, innocent. And yet it seemed to me, day by day, our meals grew poorer and poorer in quality. I convinced myself it didn't really matter if we missed out on one Christmas shopping spree. There would be other Christmases when we were rich, 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 when we could go into a store and buy anything we wanted. How beautiful we'd be in our magnificent clothes with our stylish manners and soft, eloquent voices that told the world we were somebodies, somebodies who were special, loved, wanted, needed somebodies. Of course, Chris and I knew there wasn't a real Santa Claus, but we very much wanted the twins to believe in Santa Claus and not miss out on all that glorious enchantment of a fat, jolly man who whizzed about the world to deliver to all children exactly what they wanted, even when they didn't know what they wanted until they had it. What would childhood be like without believing in Santa Claus? Not the kind of childhood I wanted for our twins. Even for those locked away, Christmas was a busy time, even for one beginning to despair and doubt and distrust. Secretly, Chris and I had been making gifts for Mama, who really didn't need anything, and gifts for the twins, plushy stuffed animals that we tediously backstitched by hand and then filled with cotton. I did all the embroidery work on the faces when they were still flat. 
I was in private in the bathroom, knitting Chris a cap of scarlet wool. It grew and it grew and it grew. I think Mama must have forgotten to tell me something about Gage. Then Chris came up with an absolutely idiotic and horrific suggestion. Let's make the grandmother a gift too. It's really not right to leave her out. She does bring up our food and milk, and who knows, a token like this may be just the thing needed to win over her affection. And think how much more enjoyable our lives would be if she could tolerate us. I was dopey enough to think it might work, and for hours and hours we slaved on a gift for an old witch who hated us. In all this time, she had never even once said our names. We bonded tan linen to a stretcher frame, glued on different coloured stones, then carefully applied gold and brown cording. If we made a mistake, ever so painstakingly, we'd do it over and make it right so she wouldn't notice. She was bound to be a perfectionist who'd see the slightest flaw and frown, and never truly would we give her anything less than our best efforts could produce. You see, said Chris again. I really do believe we have a chance in winning her over to our side. After all, she is our grandmother, and people do change. No one is static. While Mama works to charm her father, we must work to charm her mother. And even if she refuses to look at me, she does look at you. She didn't look at me, not really. She only saw my hair. For some reason, she was fascinated by my hair. Remember, Kathy, she did give us yellow chrysanthemums. He was right. That alone was a strong straw to grasp. In the late afternoon, toward dusk, Mama came to our room bearing a live Christmas tree in a small wooden tub, a balsam tree. What could smell more like Christmas? Mama's wool dress was of bright red jersey. It clung and showed off all the curves I hoped to have one day. She was laughing and gay, making us happy too. As she stayed to help us trim the tree with the miniature ornaments and lights she'd brought along, she gave us four stockings to drape on the bedposts for Santa to find and fill. Next year, this time, we'll be living in our own house," she said brightly, and I believed. "Yes," said Mamma, smiling, filling all of us with cheer. "Next year, this time, life will be so wonderful for all of us." We'll have plenty of money to buy a grand home of our own, and everything you want will be yours. In no time at all, you'll forget this room, the attic, and all the days you have all endured so bravely will be forgotten, just like it never happened. She kissed us and said she loved us. We watched her leave and didn't feel bereft as before. She filled all our eyes, all our hopes and dreams. Mama came in the night while we slept. In the morning, I woke up to see the stockings filled to the brim, and gifts galore were stacked under the small table where the tree was. And in every empty available space in that room were all the toys for the twins that were too large and awkward to wrap. My eyes met with Chris's. He winked, grinned, then bounded from his bed. He grabbed for the silver bells attached to red plastic reins, and he shook them vigorously above his head. Merry Christmas! He boomed. Wake up, everybody! Corey, Terry, you sleepyheads, open your eyes, get up and behold, look and see what Santa Claus brought. They came so slowly out of dreams, rubbing at sticky eyes, staring in disbelief at the many toys, at the beautifully wrapped packages with name tags, at the striped stockings stuffed with cookies, nuts, candy, fruit, chewing gum, peppermint sticks, chocolate Santas. Real candy at last, hard candy—that colourful kind that churches and schools gave out at their parties, the best kind of candy for making black holes in your teeth. Oh, but it looked and tasted so Christmassy. Corey sat on his bed, bedazzled, and again his small fists lifted to rub at his eyes, and he appeared too bewildered for speech. But Carrie could always find words. How did Santa Claus find us? Oh, Santa has magic eyes," explained Chris, who lifted Carrie up and swung her to his shoulder, and then he reached to do this to Corey too. He was doing as Daddy would have done, and tears came to my eyes. Santa would never overlook children deliberately," he said, "and besides, he knew you were here. 
I made sure he knew, for I sat down and wrote him one very long letter and gave him our address, and I made out a list of things we wanted that was three feet long. How funny, I thought, for the list of what all four of us wanted was so short and simple. We wanted outside. We wanted our freedom. I sat up in bed and looked around and felt a sour, sweet lump in my throat. Mama had tried. Oh, yes, she tried, done her best from the way it looked. She did love us. She did care. Why, it must have taken her months to buy all of this. I was ashamed and full of contrition for everything mean and ugly I'd thought. That's what came from wanting everything and at once and having no patience and no faith. Chris turned to look at me questioningly. Aren't you ever going to get up? Going to sit there the whole day through? You don't like gifts any more? While Corey and Carrie tore off gift wrappings, Chris came over to me and stretched out his hand. Come, Kathy, enjoy the only Christmas you'll have in your twelfth year. Make this a unique Christmas, different from any we will experience in the future. His blue eyes pleaded. He was wearing rumpled red pajamas piped in white, and his gold hair fluffed out wildly. I was wearing a red nightgown made of fleece, and my long hair was far more disheveled than his. Into his warm hand I put my own, and I laughed. Christmas was Christmas, no matter where you were, and whatever the circumstances, it was still a day to enjoy. We opened everything wrapped, and we tried on our new clothes while stuffing candy into our mouths before breakfast. And Santa had left a note telling us to hide the candy from a certain you-know-who. After all, candy still caused cavities, even on Christmas Day. I sat on the floor wearing a stunning new robe of green velvet, Chris had a new robe of red flannel to match his pyjamas. I dressed the twins in their new robes of bright blue. I don't think there could have been four happier children than we were early that morning. Chocolate bars were devilishly divine and made even sweeter because they were forbidden. It was pure a heaven to hold that chocolate in my mouth and slowly, slowly let it melt while I squeezed my eyelids tight to better savour the taste. And when I looked, Chris had his eyes closed, too. Funny how the twins ate their chocolate with wide-open eyes so full of surprise. Had they forgotten about candy? It seemed so, for they appeared to be holding paradise in their mouths. When we heard the doorknob rattle, we quickly hid the candy under the nearest bed. It was the grandmother. She came in quietly with the picnic basket. She put the basket on the gaming table. She didn't greet us with Merry Christmas, nor did she say good morning, or even smile, or show in any way that this was a special day, and we were not to speak to her unless she spoke to us first. It was with reluctance and fear, and also with great hope, that I picked up the long package wrapped in red foil that had come from one of Mama's gifts to us. Beneath that beautiful paper was our collage painting on which all four of us had worked to create a child's version of the perfect garden. The old trunks in the attic had provided us with fine materials, such as the gossamer silk to make the pastel butterflies that hovered over bright yarn flowers. How Carrie had wanted to make purple butterflies with red spots. She loved purple combined with red. If ever a more glorious butterfly existed, it wouldn't be a live one, it would be Corrie's, made of yellow with green and black splotches and tiny little red stone eyes. Our trees were made of brown cording combined with tiny tan pebbles to look like bark, and the branches gracefully entwined so brightly coloured birds could perch or fly between the leaves. Chris and I had taken chicken feathers from old pillows and dipped them in watercolours and dried them and used an old toothbrush to comb the matted hairs and make them lovely again. It may be conceited to say that our picture showed signs of true artistry and a great deal of creative ingenuity. Our composition was balanced, yet it had rhythm, style, and a charm that had brought tears to our mother's eyes when we showed it to her. She had to turn her back so we too wouldn't cry. Oh, yes, by far this collage was the very best piece of artwork we had as yet turned out. Trembling, apprehensive, 
I waited to time my approach so her hands would be empty. Since the grandmother never looked at Chris, and the twins were so terrified of her they shriveled in her presence, it was up to me to give her the gift. And darned if I could make my feet move. Sharply, Chris nudged me with his elbow. Go on, he whispered. She'll go out the door in a minute. My feet seemed nailed to the floor. I held the long red package across both my arms. From the very positioning it seemed a sacrificial offering, for it wasn't easy to give her anything when she had given us nothing but hostility and was waiting her chance to give us pain. That Christmas morning she succeeded very well in giving us pain, even without a whip or a word. I wanted to greet her in the proper way and say, Merry Christmas Day, Grandmother. We wanted to give you a little something. Really, don't thank us. It was no trouble at all. Just a little something to show how much we appreciate the food you bring to us each day and the shelter you have given us. No, no, she would think me sarcastic if I put it that way. Much better to say something like this. Merry Christmas. We hope you like this gift. We all worked on it, even Corey and Carrie, and you can keep it so when we're gone you'll know we did try, we did. Just to see me near with the gift held before me took her by surprise. Slowly, with my eyes lifting to bravely meet hers, I held out our Christmas offering. I didn't want to plead with my eyes. I wanted her to take it and like it and say thank you, even if she said it coldly. I wanted her to go to bed this night and think about us, that maybe we weren't so bad after all. I wanted her to digest and savour all the work we'd put into her gift, and I wanted her to question the right and wrong of how she treated us. In the most withering way, her cold and scornful eyes lowered to the long box we'd wrapped in red. On the top was a sprig of artificial holly and a huge silver bow. A card was tied to the bow and read, To Grandmother, from Chris, Kathy, Corey and Carrie. Her grey stone eyes lingered on the card long enough to read it, then she lifted her gaze to stare directly into my hopeful eyes, pleading, begging, wanting so much to be assured we weren't, as I sometimes feared, evil. Back to the box her eyes skipped, then deliberately she turned her back. Without a word she stalked out of the door, slammed it hard, then locked it from the other side. I was left in the middle of the room holding the end product of many long hours of striving for perfection and beauty. Fools, that's what we'd been, damned fools. We'd never win her over. She'd always consider us devil's spawn. As far as she was concerned, we really didn't exist. And it hurt. Oh, you bet it did hurt. Right down to my bare feet I ached, and my heart became a hollow ball shooting pain through my chest. Behind me I could hear Chris raspily breathing in and out, and the twins began to whimper. This was my time to be adult and keep the poise that Mama used so well and so effectively. I patterned my movements and my expressions after those of my mother. I used my hands the way she used hers. I smiled as she did, slow and beguiling. And what did I do to demonstrate my maturity? I hurled the package to the floor. I swore, using words I'd never said aloud before. I raised my foot and stomped down on it and heard the cardboard box crunch. I screamed. Wild with fury, I jumped with both feet onto the gift, and I wildly stomped and jumped until I heard the cracking of the beautiful old frame we'd found in the attic and re-glued and refinished and made it look almost like new again. I hated Chris for persuading me that we could win over a woman of stone. I hated Mama for putting us in this position. She should have known her mother better. She should have sold shoes in a department store. Certainly there was something she could have done but what she did. Beneath the assault of someone wild and frenzied, the dry frame shattered into splinters. All our labor was gone, gone. Stop, cried Chris. We can keep it for ourselves. Though he ran fast to prevent total destruction, the fragile painting was ruined, forever gone. I was in tears. Then I was bending down, crying, and picking up the silk butterflies Corey and Carrie had made so painstakingly, with so much effort wasted to colour the wings gloriously. Pastel butterflies I was to keep all my life long. 
Chris held me fast in his arms while I sobbed as he tried to comfort me with fatherly words. It's all right. It doesn't matter what she does. We were right and she was wrong. We tried. She never tries. We sat on the floor, silent now amidst our gifts. The twins were quiet, their big eyes full of doubts, wanting to play with their toys and undecided because they were our mirrors and they would reflect our emotions, whatever they were. Oh, the pity of seeing them so made me ache again. I was twelve. I should learn at some time in my life how to act my age and hold on to my poise and not be a stick of dynamite always ready to explode. Into our room, Mama came, smiling and calling out her Christmas greetings. She came bearing more gifts, including a huge dollhouse that once had been hers and her hateful mother's. This gift is not from Santa Claus, she said, putting down the house on the floor with great care, and now I swear there wasn't one inch of uncluttered space left. This is my present to Corey and Carrie. She hugged them both and kissed their cheeks and told them now they could pretend house and pretend parents and pretend host and hostess, just as she used to do when she was a child of five. If she noticed none of us was really excited by that grand dollhouse, she didn't comment. With laughter and gay charm, she knelt on the floor and sat back on her heels and told us of how very much she used to love this dollhouse. It is very valuable, too, she gushed. On the right market, a dollhouse like this would bring a fabulous fortune. Just the miniature porcelain dolls with the movable joints alone are priceless, their faces all hand-painted. The dolls are made in scale to the house, as is the furniture, the paintings, everything, in fact. The house was handcrafted by an artist who lived in England. Each chair, table, bed, lamp, chandelier, all are genuine reproductions of antiques. I understand it took the craftsman twelve years to complete this, Look at how the little doors open and close, perfectly hung, which is more than you can say for the house you're living in, she went on. And all the drawers slide in and out. There's a tiny little key to lock the desk. And look how some of the doors slide into the walls. Pocket doors, they are called. I wish this house had doors like that. I don't know why they went out of fashion. And see the hand-carved mouldings near the ceiling and the wainscoting in the dining room and the library and the teensy books on the shelves? Believe it or not, if you have a microscope, you can read the text. She demonstrated with knowing, careful fingers all the fascinations of a dollhouse only children of the extremely wealthy could ever hope to own. Chris, of course, had to pull out a tiny book and hold it close to his squinting eyes to see for himself print so small you needed a microscope. There was a very special type of microscope he hoped to own some day, and I hoped to be the one to give it to him. I couldn't help but admire the skill and patience it would take to make such small furniture. There was a grand piano in the front parlour of the Elizabethan house. The piano was covered with a silken paisley shawl with fringes of gold. Little bitty silk flowers were scented on the dining room table. Bitsy fruit made of wax was in a silver bowl on the buffet. Two crystal chandeliers hung down, and real candles were fitted into sockets. Servants were in the kitchen wearing aprons while they prepared dinner. A butler wore livery white while he stood near the front door to greet the arriving guests, while in the front parlour the beautifully gowned ladies stood stiffly near poker-faced men. Upstairs in the nursery were three children, and a baby was in the crib, arms outstretched and ready to be lifted up. A side building was attached somewhat to the rear, and in it there was such a coach, and two horses were in the stables. Golly day, who would ever dream people could make things so small? My eyes jumped to the windows, drinking in the dainty white curtains and heavy drapes, and dishes were on the dining table, and silverware and pots and pans were in the kitchen cupboards, all so tiny they were no bigger than large green peas. Kathy said Mama, putting her arm around me, look at this little rug. It is a genuine Persian made of pure silk. The rug in the dining room is an oriental. And on and on she extolled the virtues of this remarkable plaything. How can it look so new, yet be so old? I asked. 
A dark cloud passed over Mama and shadowed her face. When it belonged to my mother, it was kept in a huge glass box. She was allowed to look at it, but she could never touch it. When it was given to me, my father took a hammer and broke the glass box, and he allowed me to play with everything on the condition that I would swear with my hand on the Bible not to break anything. Did you swear and did you break anything? questioned Chris. Yes, I swore, and yes, I did break something. Her head bowed low so we couldn't watch her eyes. There was another doll, a very handsome young man, and his arm came off when I tried to take off his coat. I was whipped not only for breaking the doll, but for wanting to see what was underneath the clothes. Chris and I sat silent. But Carrie perked up and showed great interest in the funny little dolls in their fancy, colourful costumes. She particularly favoured the baby in the crib. Because she was so interested, Cory moved so he too could investigate the many treasures of the dollhouse. That was when Mama turned her attention on me. Kathy, why were you looking so solemn when I came in? Didn't you like your gifts? Because I couldn't answer, Chris answered for me. She's unhappy because the grandmother refused the gift we made for her. Mama patted my shoulder, but she avoided my eyes. Chris continued, And thank you for everything. There is nothing you didn't remind Santa Claus to bring. Thank you most of all for the dollhouse. I think our twins are going to have more fun with that than anything else. I fixed my gaze on the two tricycles for the twins to ride in the attic and strengthen their thin, weak legs while they pedaled. There were roller skates for Chris and me to use in the attic schoolroom only. That room was insulated with plastered walls and hardwood flooring, making it more soundproof than the rest of the attic. Mama got up from her knees, smiling mysteriously before she left. Just outside the door, she said she'd be back in a second or two, and that is when she really gave us the best gift of all, a small, portable TV set. My father gave this to me to use in my bedroom, and immediately I knew just who would enjoy it the most. Now you have a real window through which you can view the world. Just the right words to send my hopes flying high into the sky. Mama, I cried out, your father gave you an expensive gift? Does that mean he likes you now? Has he forgiven you for marrying Daddy? Can we go downstairs now? Her blue eyes went dark and troubled again, and there was no joy when she told us that, yes, her father was friendlier, he had forgiven her for committing a sin against God and society. Then she said something that jumped my heart right up against my throat. Next week, my father is having his lawyer write me into his will. He is going to leave me everything. Even this house will be mine after my mother dies. He isn't planning on leaving her money because she has wealth she inherited from her father and mother. Money. I didn't care anything about it. All I wanted was out. And suddenly I was very happy. So happy, I flung my arms around Mama, kissed her cheek, and hugged her tight. Golly lolly, this was the best day since we'd come to this house. And then I remembered Mama hadn't said we could go downstairs yet. But we were one step on our way to freedom. Our mother sat on the bed and smiled with her lips, though not her eyes. She laughed at some silly things Chris and I said, and it was laughter brittle and hard, not at all her kind of laugh. Yes, Kathy, I have become the dutiful, obedient daughter your grandfather always wanted. He speaks, I obey. He orders, I jump. I have at last managed to please him. She stopped abruptly and looked toward the double windows and the pale light beyond. As a matter of fact, I have pleased him so well, he is giving me a party tonight to reintroduce me to my old friends and the local society. It is to be a grand affair, for my parents do everything in a big way when they entertain. They don't imbibe themselves, but they don't mind serving liquor to those who don't fear hell. So, of course, it will be catered, and there will also be a small orchestra for dancing. A party? A Christmas party? With an orchestra for dancing and catered? And Mama was being written into the new will? Was there ever such a happy, wonderful day? Can we watch? Chris and I cried out almost simultaneously. We'll be very quiet. We'll hide so no one can see us. Please, Mama, please, it's been so long since we saw other people, and we've never been to a Christmas Day party. We pleaded and pleaded until at last she could resist no longer. 
She drew Chris and me aside to a far corner where the twins couldn't overhear, and she whispered, There is one place where the two of you can hide and still be able to watch, but I cannot risk the twins. They're too young to be trusted, and you know they can't sit still for longer than two seconds, and Carrie would probably scream out in delight and rivet everyone's attention, so swear on your word of honor you will not tell them. We promised. No, of course we wouldn't tell them, even without a vow to keep our silence. We loved our little twins, and we wouldn't hurt their feelings by letting them know they were missing out. We sang Christmas carols after Mama had gone, and the day passed cheerfully enough, though there was nothing special in the picnic basket for us to eat. Ham sandwiches, which the twins didn't like, and cold slices of turkey that were still icy as if they had been taken from the freezer. Leftovers from Thanksgiving Day. As evening came on so early, I sat for the longest time, gazing over at the dollhouse, where Carrie and Corey played happily with the tiny porcelain people and the priceless miniatures. Funny how much you can learn from inanimate objects that a little girl had once owned and been allowed to look at but never touch. And then another little girl came along, and the dollhouse was given to her, and the glass box smashed just so she could touch the objects inside, so she could be punished when she broke something. A shivering thought came. I wondered just what Carrie or Corey would break and what their punishment would be. I shoved a bit of chocolate into my mouth and sweetened the sourness of my roving, wicked thoughts. Chapter 10 The Christmas Party True to her word, not long after the twins were sound asleep, Mama slipped into our room. She looked so beautiful, my heart swelled with pride and admiration, and with some envy, too. Her long, formal gown had a skirt of flowing green chiffon. The bodice was of a deeper green velvet, cut low to show off a lot of cleavage. Underneath the streaming panels of lighter green chiffon were shoestring straps that glittered. Diamond and emerald earrings dangled, long and sparkling. Her scent reminded me of a musky, perfumed garden on a moonlit night somewhere in the Orient. No wonder Chris stared at her as if dazzled. Wistfully, I sighed. Oh, God, please let me look like that one day. Let me have all those swelling curves that men so admire. And when she moved, the panels of chiffon floated as wings, leading us out of our sequestered dim place for the first time. Down all the dark and wide halls of the northern wing we followed close at Mama's silver heels. She whispered, there's a place where I used to hide when I was a child to watch the adult parties without my parents knowing. It's going to be cramped for the two of you, but it's the only place where you can hide and still see. Now promise again to be quiet, and if you get sleepy, slip unseen back to your room. Remember how to get there. She told us not to watch longer than an hour, for the twins would be frightened to wake up and find themselves alone. Then, possibly, they'd wander out into the hall looking for us, and God alone knew what could happen if they did. We were secreted inside a massive, oblong, dark table, with cabinet doors underneath. It was uncomfortable and very stuffy, but we could see well enough through the fine, mesh-like screen on the back side. Silently, Mama stole away. Far below us was a mammoth room, brilliantly lit with candles fitted in the five tiers of three gigantic crystal and gold chandeliers, suspended from a ceiling so high above we couldn't see it. I never saw so many candles burning all at once. The scent of them, the way flickering lights glowed and caught in the sparkling prisms to scatter and refract beams of iridescence from all the jewellery the women wore, made it a scene from a dream. No, better, more like a movie, sharp, clear a ballroom where Cinderella and Prince Charming might dance. Hundreds of richly dressed people milled about laughing, talking, and over in the corner towered a Christmas tree that was beyond belief. It must have been more than twenty feet high, and it sparkled all over with thousands of golden lights to shine on the colorful ornaments and bedazzle your eyes. Dozens of servants in black and red uniforms flowed in and out of the ballroom bearing silver trays laden with dainty party food, and they set them on long tables where a giant crystal fountain sprayed pale amber fluid into a silver receiving bowl. Many men and women came to hold stemmed goblets and catch the sparkling liquid. There were two other punch bowls of silver with small matching cups, both bowls large enough for a child to bathe in, 
It was beautiful, glamorous, exciting, exhilarating, and so good to know that happy living was still going on outside our locked door. Kathy, whispered Chris into my ear, I'd sell my soul to the devil to have just one single sip from that crystal and silver fountain. My very same thought. Never had I felt so hungry, so thirsty, so deprived. Yet we both were charmed, enchanted, and bedazzled by all the splendor of what great wealth could buy and display. The floor where couples danced was laid out in mosaic patterns, and was waxed so it gleamed like reflecting glass. Huge gold-framed mirrors were on the walls reflecting back the dancers, so you could hardly tell the images from the reality. The frames of the many chairs and sofas lining the walls were gold-colored, and the padded seats and backs were of red velvet or white brocade. French chairs, of course. They just had to be Louis the Fourteenth or Fifteenth. Fancy! Good golly day! Chris and I stared at the couples who were the most beautiful and young. We commented on their clothing, their hairstyles, and speculated on what relationships they had going for them. But most of all, we watched our mother, who was the center of attention. Most often, she danced with a tall, handsome man with dark hair and a big mustache. He was the one who brought her stemmed goblets and a plate of food, and they sat on a velvet couch to eat canapes and hors d'oeuvres. I thought they sat too close. Quickly, I took my eyes from them to take a look at the three chefs behind the long tables, still cooking what looked like pancakes to me and little sausages to be stuffed with fillings. The aroma of all that drifted up to us, making our salivary glands overwork. Our meals were monotonous, boring things. Sandwiches, soups, and that everlasting fried chicken and eternal potato salad. Down there was a gourmet feast of everything delicious. Food was hot down there. Ours was seldom even warm. We kept our milk on the attic stairs so it wouldn't sour, and sometimes we found ice on the top. If we kept our picnic basket of food on the attic stairs, the mice stole down to nibble on everything. From time to time, Mama disappeared with that man. Where did they go, and what did they do? Did they kiss? Was she falling in love? Even from my high and remote place in the cabinet, I could tell that man was fascinated by Mama. He couldn't take his eyes from her face or keep his hands from touching her. And when they danced to music that was slow, he held her so his cheek pressed to hers. When they stopped dancing, he kept his arm around her shoulders or her waist, and once he dared to even touch her breast. I thought that now she would slap his good-looking face, for I would. But she only turned and laughed and pushed him away, saying something that must have been a warning not to do that in public. And he smiled and took her hand and raised it to his lips while their eyes locked long and meaningfully, or so I thought. Chris, do you see Mama with that man? Sure I see them. He's just as tall as Daddy was. Did you see what he just did? They're eating and drinking and laughing and talking and dancing just like everybody else. Kathy, just think, when Mama inherits all that money, we can have parties like this on Christmas and on our birthdays. Why, in the future, we might even have some of the very same guests we see now. Let's send invitations to our friends back in Gladstone. Boy, won't they be surprised to see what we inherit. Just then, Mama and that man got up from the couch and left. So we fastened our charmed eyes on the second most attractive woman in the group below and watched her and pitied her, for how could she compete with our mother? Then into the ballroom strode our grandmother, looking neither left nor right nor smiling at anyone. Her dress wasn't grey, and that alone was enough to astonish us. Her long formal gown was of ruby red velvet, tight in the front and flowing in the back, and her hair was piled high on her head and curled elaborately, and ruby and diamond jewelry sparkled on her neck, ears, arms, and fingers. Who would ever think that impressive, regal-looking woman down there was the menacing grandmother who visited us each day? Reluctantly, we had to admit in whispers back and forth, She does look magnificent. Yes, very impressive. Like an Amazon, too big. A mean Amazon. Yeah, a warrior Amazon, ready to do battle with the glare of her eyes alone. She doesn't really need any other weapon. That's when we saw him, our unknown grandfather. 
It stole my breath away to look down and see a man so very much like our father if he had lived long enough to become old and feeble. He sat in a shiny wheelchair, dressed in a tuxedo, and his formal shirt was white with black trim. His thinning blonde hair was almost white, and it shone silver under the lights. His skin was unlined, at least viewed from our far and high and hidden place. Appalled as well as fascinated, neither Chris nor I could move our eyes anywhere else once we spied him. He was fragile-looking, but still unnaturally handsome for a man of his great age of sixty-seven and a man who was near dead. Suddenly, frighteningly, he raised his head and he gazed upward, directly at our hiding place. For one awful, terrifying moment, it seemed he knew we were there, hidden behind the wire screen. A small smile played on his lips. Oh, dear God, what did that smile mean? Still, he didn't look nearly as heartless as the grandmother. Could he truly be the cruel and arbitrary tyrant we presumed him to be? From the gentle, kindly smiles he bestowed on all those who came up to greet him and shake his hand and pat his shoulder, he seemed benign enough. Just an old man in a wheelchair who really didn't look very sick. Yet he was the one who had ordered our mother to be stripped and whipped from her neck down to her heels, and he had watched. So how could we ever forgive him for that? I didn't know he would look like Daddy, I whispered to Chris. Why not? Daddy was his much younger half-brother. Grandfather was a grown man before our father was born, and married, too, with two sons of his own before he had a half-brother. That was Malcolm Neil Foxworth down there, the one who had kicked out his younger stepmother and her little son. Poor Mama. How could we blame her for falling in love with a half-uncle when he was as young and as handsome and charming as our father had been? With such parents as she'd described, she did have to have someone to love, and she did need to be loved in return. She did. He did. Love. It came unbidden. You couldn't help whom you fell in love with. Cupid's arrows were ill-aimed. Such ran the whispered comments between Chris and me. Then we were suddenly hushed by the footfalls and voices of two people approaching our hiding place. Corinne hasn't changed at all, said a man unseen by us, only to grow more beautiful and even more mysterious. She's a very intriguing woman. Ha! Huh, that's because you always did have a yen for her, Al, responded his female companion. Too bad she didn't have eyes for you instead of Christopher Foxworth. Now there was a man who was really something else. But I marvel that those two narrow-minded bigots down there would allow themselves to forgive Corinne for marrying her half-uncle. They have to forgive her. When you have only one child left out of three, you are forced to take that one back into the fold. Isn't it peculiar how things work out? asked the woman, her voice thick and guttural from too much liquor. Three children, and only the despised, regretted one is left to inherit all of this. The half-drunken man chortled. <laughs> Corinne wasn't always so despised. Remember how the old man adored her? She could do no wrong in his eyes until she eloped with Christopher. But that harried mother of hers never had any patience with her daughter. Jealous, maybe. But what a luscious, rich plum to fall into the hands of Bartholomew Winslow. Wish it were mine, said the unseen Al wistfully. I'll bet you do, sarcastically scoffed the woman who set something down on our table that sounded like a glass with ice inside. A beautiful, young and rich woman is indeed a plum for any man. Much too heady for a slob like you, Albert Dunn. Corinne Foxworth would never look at you, not now, not even when you were young. Besides, you're stuck with me. The bickering pair drifted out of earshot. Other voices came and went as the long hours passed. My brother and I were tired now of watching, and we were both very much needing the bathroom. Plus, we were worried about the twins left alone in the bedroom. What if one of the guests wandered into the forbidden room and saw the sleeping twins? Then all the world and our grandfather would know that our mother had four children. A crowd gathered around our hiding place to laugh, talk, and drink. It took them forever to move away and give us the opportunity to open the cabinet door with extreme caution. 
Seeing no one, we scampered out, then dashed pell-mell in the direction from which we'd come. Breathless and panting, our bladders full enough to pop, we reached our quiet, cloistered place unseen, unheard. And just as we'd left them, our twins lay deeply asleep in separate beds. They seemed identical, weak-looking, pale dolls, like children used to look a long time ago in the pictures in history books. They weren't today's kind of children at all. But once they'd been... And they would be again, I vowed. Next thing, Chris and I were arguing over who got to use the bathroom first. And this was easily settled. He just pushed me down on a bed and took off, slamming the bathroom door behind him and locking it. I fumed that it seemed to take him forever to empty his bladder. Good golly, how could he hold so much? Nature's calls eased, bickering over, we huddled together to discuss what we'd just witnessed and overheard. "'Do you think Mama plans to marry Bartholomew Winslow?' I asked, "'twisting my ever-present anxieties into a knot. "'How do I know?' answered Chris in an offhand manner, "'though it certainly seems everybody else thinks she will. "'And, of course, they know more about that side of her than we do. "'What an odd thing to say. "'Didn't we, her children, know our mother better than anyone else?' "'Chris, why did you say that?' "'What?' What you did about others knowing her better than we do. People are multifaceted, Kathy. To us, our mother is only our mother. To others, she is a beautiful, sexy young widow who is likely to inherit a fortune. No wonder the moths all come swarming to encircle the kind of bright flame she is. Wow! And he was taking all of this so casually, just as if it didn't matter to him one whit, when I knew it did. I thought I knew my brother very well. He must be suffering inside just as I was, for I knew he didn't want our mother to marry again. I turned my most intuitive eyes upon him. Ah, he wasn't nearly as detached as he seemed, and that pleased me. I sighed, though, for I would so much like to be the eternal optimist like him. Deep down, I thought life was sure to always put me between Scylla and Charybdis and to give to me always Hobson's choice. I had to make myself over, make myself better and become like Chris, eternally cheerful. When I suffered, I had to learn to hide it as he did. I had to learn to smile and never frown and not be the genuine clairvoyant I was. Already we had discussed between us the possibility that our mother might marry again, and neither one of us wanted that to happen. We thought of her as still belonging to our father. We wanted her to be faithful to his memory, ever constant to his first love. And if she remarried, just where would the four of us fit in? Would that Winslow man with his handsome face and big moustache want four children who weren't his? Kathy, mused Chris aloud, do you realize this is the perfect time to explore this house? Our door is unlocked, the grandparents are downstairs, Mama is occupied. The perfect chance to find out all we can about this house. No, I cried, frightened. Suppose the grandmother found out. She'd whip the skin off all of us. Then you stay with the twins, he said with surprising firmness. If I'm caught, which I won't be, I'll suffer the whipping and take all the blame. Think of it this way. Some day we may need to know how to escape this house. An amused smile curved his lips before he went on. I'm going to disguise myself anyway, just in case I'm seen. Disguise? How? But I'd forgotten the treasure trove of old clothes in the attic. He was up there only a few minutes before he came down wearing an old-fashioned dark suit that wasn't much too large. Chris was big for his age. Over his blonde head he'd fitted a ratty dark wig he'd found in a trunk. Just possibly he might be mistaken for a small man, if the lights were dim enough. A ridiculously funny-looking man. Jauntily, he paraded back and forth in front of me. Then he leaned forward and stalked around Groucho Marx style, holding an invisible cigar. He stopped directly in front of me, grinning self-consciously as he bowed deeply and doffed an invisible top hat in a wide and gentlemanly gesture of respect. I had to laugh. And he laughed, too, and not just with his eyes. Then he straightened up to say, Now, tell me truthfully, who could recognize this dark and sinister small man as belonging to the giant Foxworth clan? 
no one, for who had ever seen a fox with such as he? An awkward, lean and gangling one with clear-cut features and dark bird-nest hair, plus a smudgy pencil moustache. Not a photograph in the attic resembled what swaggered about showing off. Okay, Chris, cut the act. Go on, find out what you can, but don't stay away too long either. I don't like it here without you. He came closer to whisper in a sly and conspiratorial stage whisper. I'll be back soon, my fair beauty, and when I'm back I shall bring with me all the dark and mysterious secrets of this huge, huge, old, old house. And suddenly he caught me by surprise and swooped to plant a kiss on my cheek. Secrets? And he said I was given to exaggerations. What was the matter with him? Didn't he know that we were the secrets? I was already bathed and shampooed and dressed for bed, and, of course, on Christmas night I couldn't go to bed in a nightgown I'd worn before, not when I had several new ones Santa had brought. It was a lovely gown I wore, white with full long sleeves that ruffled at the wrists and was beaded through with blue satin ribbon, and everything was lace-edged with smocking across the front and back of the bodice, and dainty pink roses with a tracery of delicately embroidered green leaves. It was one lovely nightgown, exquisitely made, and it made me feel beautiful and exquisite just to have it on. Chris swept his eyes from my hair down to my bare toes that just barely peeked from beneath my long gown, and his eyes told me something they'd never said quite as eloquently before. He stared at my face, at my hair that cascaded down past my waist, and I knew it gleamed from all the brushing I gave it every day. He seemed impressed and dazzled, just as he had when he'd gazed so long at Mama's swelling bosom above the green velvet bodice. And no wonder he had kissed me voluntarily. I was so princess-like. He stood in the doorway, hesitating, still looking at me in my new nightgown, and I guess he was very happy to be playing the knight gallant, protective of his lady fair, of small children and everyone who relied upon his audacity. "'Take care until you see me again,' he whispered. Christopher, I whispered back, all you need is a white horse and a shield. No, he whispered again, a unicorn and a lance with a green dragon's head upon its point, and back I'll gallop in my shining white armor while the blizzard blows in the month of August and the sun is mid-sky, and when I dismount you'll be looking up at someone who stands twelve feet high, so speak respectfully when you speak to me, my lady Catherine. Yes, my lord. Go forth and slay yonder dragon, but take not over long, for I could be undone by all that menaces me and mine in this stone-cold castle, where all the drawbridges are up and the portcullises are down. Farewell, he whispered. Have no fear. Soon I'll be back to care for thee and thine. I giggled as I climbed into bed to lie down beside Carrie. Sleep was an elusive stranger that night as I thought about my mother and that man, about Chris about all boys, about men, about romance and love. As I slipped softly into dreams with music playing down below, my hand lifted to touch the small ring with the garnet heart stone that my father had put on my finger when I was only seven years old, a ring I'd outgrown so long ago, my touchstone, my talisman, worn now on a very fine gold chain. <laughs>